Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day two of the sixth International Barcode of Life Conference. Um, before we get started with this morning's plenary session, uh, I have a few more housekeeping details uh, that I would like to attend to. First, I think we have to give thanks to the rain gods for holding off on us yesterday so that our barbecue came off uh, with nice weather and without a hitch. Um, that was a, a big plus. We may yet be getting some, uh, some summer thunderstorms, uh, so hopefully they'll hold out on us. But at any rate, there are a few things that we still have to uh, plead with you about. If you are a speaker and you have not yet uploaded your presentation, please move to do so as soon as possible. Uh, we're still missing some presentations uh, from later this afternoon and the following days, and, and we would like to get them all uploaded so that the parallel sessions can proceed as smoothly as possible. Um, similarly, if you are an evaluator of a student presentation, uh, please don't forget to score those presentations and hand in your score reports at the admin room, uh, ideally uh, after each session or certainly at the end of the day, if at all possible. Uh, I'd also like to mention that there have been a few items uh, that have been found in various rooms after the sessions have closed. So we also have lost and found in the admin room. If there's anything uh, that you think you're missing, certainly check there for it. Uh, it may be waiting for you. We also have uh, a few extra conference t-shirts. So if anyone is interested in taking home an extra conference t-shirt, <laughs> I meant to do that. Um, there, there are also conference t-shirts available for $15 um, at, the, at the admin office. There are a couple of other details that has come to my attention. There was a little bit of confusion in the program uh, that I wanted to provide some clarification on. This afternoon, uh, from 1.30 to 5.30, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency and, and colleagues from some of the other federal departments here in Canada who are using barcoding are holding a regulatory applications workshop in Rosansky 103. That's open to everyone in the conference. Uh, the list of speakers at that session are not in the program, but they are on the conference website if you're interested in looking to see who's speaking in the CFIA workshop. Uh, unfortunately, it does run opposite to our uh, afternoon parallel session and the poster session. Uh, but for those of you who are interested in regulatory applications, you, you may want to consider attending part or, or all of that workshop. Lastly, our special evening plenary event tonight at the River Run Center is free and open to everyone. There was some confusion about whether or not we had to pay a fee to attend that. Your conference badge is your entry fee into the River Run Center's event tonight. The buses are going to be leaving from the bus loop directly after the poster session at 5.30. We'll get down, it's a short, maybe a five to 10 minute ride downtown to the River Run, uh, where the City of Guelph's Chamber of Commerce is providing uh, some, uh, a welcome reception uh, with some light refreshments and uh, the doors will open to the actual theater at 6.30 uh, for that evening plenary on the state of biodiversity. We'll be discussing patterns of biodiversity change both here in Canada and internationally uh, from a number of distinguished speakers. So again, I would uh, urge you all to attend that event. The buses will be bringing you back to campus uh, after it ends, or you're welcome to uh, enjoy some of the local restaurants downtown uh, and make your own way back to campus. It's only a 20 minute walk back here from downtown and there are buses from downtown as well and taxis if, if you find walking to be difficult after visiting too many of the local pubs. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce this morning's session chair, uh, Dr. Michelle Vanderbank. Uh, she received her PhD in botany from the Rand Afrikaans University, now the University of Johannesburg in South Africa. She is an associate professor at the University of Johannesburg and head of the African Center for DNA Barcoding. 
Their mission is to fill the knowledge gap and strengthen research frameworks for international, regional, and interinstitutional cooperation in Africa in the field of DNA technology for biodiversity science. Her research group uses molecular phylogenetics, comparative analyses, intensive field and intensive field work to address questions relevant to biodiversity conservation in Africa. Please welcome today's session chair, Michelle Vandermeer. Good morning, everybody. Nice to see so many faces after last night's braai, like we call it in Africa, barbecue. We're going to start straight away because we're running a bit behind time, so it's my pleasure to introduce Charles Godfrey from the University of Oxford, who will be talking about barcode, food webs, and insect community ecology. I should apologize to Rohana, that dreadful noise was me blowing my nose before speaking, forgetting I had the microphone turned on. <laughs> So having started off by disgracing myself, I'd like to talk about uh, APA community symbionts and barcodes. Um, and I want to talk about some research that's been done in my group over the last, uh, uh, over the last 15 years or so, which has sort of um, spanned the introduction of barcodes. And uh, we use barcodes a lot now. We didn't at the beginning. And I want to talk about some of the results that we've uh, come up with and then talk about how we've incorporated barcodes and what difference they've made and what difference they might make uh, in the future. So we're motivated by both ecological and evolutionary questions. And especially in um, insect community ecology, we're very interested in how communities are put together and especially communities of plant feeding insects. Communities of plant feeding insects, where most insects feed on different host plant species. And so many of the classic competitive effects that we think um, structure other communities are unlikely to be very prevalent in these communities. But they share many natural enemies. And one of the things we've been particularly interested about is how the natural enemies, how the next trophic level can structure the community through apparent competition. So this is actually a leaf miner community here linked by their shared parasitoids. And so we build food webs in order to try and understand how they're structured and in order to build experiments. So for example, we might come up with a hypothesis about how removing one of the blue species might affect the dynamics of the other species through a shared natural enemy. But in this talk, I'm largely going to be talking about aphids and the community of aphids that we've been studying in the southeast uh, of England. So not perhaps the most charismatic of all animals, but they're wonderful to those of us who study them. But even more wonderful than aphids are the insects that attack them, and especially the parasitic wasps, the group of organisms I love the most. These are some of the parasitic wasps that attack aphids. And in addition to the direct parasitoids, there's a guild of hyperparasitoids that attack them as, uh, as well. Aphids suffer depredations of parasitoids, but also of a group of fungal entomopathogens as well, uh, much more poorly known taxonomically. And in addition to that, they're attacked by groups of predators, many of which you, you'll know well, including lacewings, including hoverflies and ladybirds, many of the very familiar insects that we, that we all know very well. So what we've been doing is over actually many years, constructing food webs of this community. So for example, this is particularly, these are quantitative food webs showing on the lower register the, um, the aphids, the width of each bar is proportional to the abundance of that aphid species. And then there are parasitoids and hyperparasitoids above it. And so you can take a complex food web time series like this, which is a statistical nightmare to analyze, and try and, an, and, try and make predictions about how the different components interact. So that's sort of the time dimension. We're also very interested in the effects of the different guilds of predators. So for example, on the top, uh, predators are far harder to study than parasitoids. When a parasitoid kills an aphid, then it sort of leaves the body in the library that you can come and see who's killed. What's much harder with predators, you've actually got to watch who eats what. 
And so you can see that there are predators, which is a highly connected web. Most predators attack multiple aphid species. The parasloids, the primary parasloids on the bottom, are much more specific, as are the fungal pathogens on the lower left. And the parasitoids, and especially a group of what we call mummy parasitoids, are much more uh, pol polyphagous. So we think that it is at, at these levels where we have natural enemies that feed on many uh, different uh, alternative uh, uh, prey items that the structuring force of apparent competition is uh, strongest. And so we have a sort of hypothesis for our community that there are three structuring sort of modules within it. At the bottom, there are the plants, and the plants are obviously competing, but we're entomologists, so we don't really uh, worry too much about that. At the next level, we hypothesize that the way that the aphids feeding on different host plants interact the most is through shared predators. And in a moment, I'm going to show you some experiments in which we've gone out to explore that. And then I won't show you about what's, what happens at the next level. The next level is slightly more complicated because there are these two groups of secondary parasitoids. But we think, and we have some experimental evidence, that shared mummy parasitoids, parasitoids that attack aphids after they've been mummified by the primary parasitoids, that they have an organizing role there. So just to give you a couple of examples of experiments with predators, uh, and this is work done by the late Christy Muller. So the type of thing we do is we take a uh, aphid and we explore its population dynamics in the presence or absence of other species. So the blue control line there is a typical trajectory of an aphid population in uh, the temperate region. Uh, this is a period through from about the middle of June into about now. And you can see a typical control, uh, uh, a typical aphid population trajectory there, the control line. In the case of the brown line, what we did is we put in the, experimentally we put in the vicinity of our focal aphid another species which we know is a very good source for the coccinellidae, for the ladybirds that attack him. And so we're having an indirect interaction here. The presence of an aphid feeding on the different host plant is having quite a major effect on the population dynamics of our focal aphid species. And let me give you an example of another, uh, another experiment we've done. One of the nice things about aphids is that you can actually ask questions about what species are not present in a community. So you get a suction trap, which is essentially a domestic hoover lying on its back, and it sucks aphids out of the air. And so you can identify these aphids. When we did it, we did it laboriously using keys. Today we'd use uh, barcodes. Um, you can identify what aphids are coming down in the aerial plankton, and then say, well, why is that aphid not there, even though it's sort of raining down into our community? And one such aphid that we expected to be present was this thing called Brachycardus cardui, which feeds on Senecio. You can see the picture up left. And so we initiated our own colonies to try and see what was keeping it out. And what we found was there was sort of diffuse apparent competition keeping it out. So the red line there is if you just put a colony on one of the Senecios and it quickly dies out. We then protected it from the typical carabid beetles, the generalist ground predators that climb up all plants. And the colonies lasted a little bit longer, but they still went in extinct. And it was only when we gave it total pred predator protection, in particular from the aphid specialist predators that were maintained by the other aphids within the community, that we were able to get the aphid to establish. So this aphid species were being excluded by diffuse apparent competition. And interestingly, in our study site, ants are quite rare because it's a rather damp site. But if you provided uh, in a forced treatment, if you provided ants by putting colonies in flower pots with sort of string going to our plants so they could come across, then you got exactly the same protection as if you artificially provide, if you artificially prevented predators from getting at it. So at the time that we were studying these community effects, we were also interested in evolutionary questions, especially the evolution of resistance against natural enemies. And we've been doing a lot of work on Drosophila, 
and prompted by some work actually by Heather Henter, who it's, I haven't seen for ages, and it's delightful to see her at this meeting again, to look at some of the uh, relationships between uh, aphids and their natural enemies. And in particular, we looked at the P. aphid, which is a sort of Drosophila melanogaster of the P. aphid world. And one of the nice things about um, aphids is that you can freeze a genotype, and you can look at a particular genotype, because aphids, as all of you know, are clonal during the summer. And so what I've plotted here is the susceptibility of different aphid clones to two species of parasitoid, those are AERV and AED, I'm sorry, I should have written them out, and a fungus uh, at the bottom. And so you can see that there is substantial clonal variation in resistance against these gills of natural enemy. And Heather, who was then working with Sarah Vea, had some evidence that there might be a trade-off between the two. And we did a whole load of experiments, and we didn't find that. And we just got a whole series of confusing uh, results, which in the end we wrote up for evolution, and I thoroughly advise you never to look at that paper. Partly because it's confusing, and partly because just after it came out, um, a group from Tucson, Kerry Oliver, Jake Russell, Nancy Moran, and Molly Hunter, came up with this really interesting result, which no one had thought. So about that time, it became apparent that many aphids, in addition to their obligate symbiont, so all aphids have a symbiont which they need to make the amino acids that are absent in their flow and diet. In addition to their obligate symbiont, many of them had facultative symbionts. So one clone will have one, another clone will have another. And Molly's group found that one of them, named Hamiltonella after the wonderful Bill Hamilton, Hamiltonella conferred resistance against parasitoids uh, to the aphids that it, it was carried in. And this instantly made sense of a lot of the results that we had that were essentially had baffled us beforehand. And uh, we, as I said, had also been studying the fungi. And so we immediately looked at a really curious result that we had. So on the left are 10 clones, clones from a species of birdfoot trephile, all of which are highly susceptible to this fungus Arrhenia. And on the right are 10 clones from clover, and that's not a PowerPoint glitch. All of them were resistant against, um, uh, against uh, the fungal pathogen. And it turned out that when we um, did some molecular biology, that um, all of them carried another symbiont, not Hamiltonella, but a symbiont called Regiella, actually named after a wonderful insect physiologist who many of you will know, Reg Chapman. So this was highly indicative. And what we then did was we did an experiment. And again, one of the nice things about this system is that you can manipulate the presence of the symbionts. You can cure them using specific antibiotics, and you can inject, uh, inject them back in. And so what we did is we took five clones of, um, of um, aphids there, the codes on, on the bottom, and um, we looked at the survival with and without symbiont. And you can see that with the symbiont, they survive reasonably well. In our particular experimental protocol, there is about 40%. If you remove the symbiont, the survival drops very, very strongly, down to about 5%. If you don't believe the results on the right, look at the results on the left. They'll convince you. <laughs> so it looks like that a different species of secondary symbiont protects against a different natural enemy. And there's a nice twist to this as well. Again, as many of you know, aphids live in either very dense colonies or in the case of the P. aphid, in rather looser colonies. So if you're killed by one of the, symb uh, by the fungi and you become this sort of sporulating mummy, then what happens is that you infect your co-clone mates. So even if you're gonna die from this fungi, you can still increase the inclusive fitness of your clone is if you die but don't sporulate. And so that we found that with the symbiont, sporulation frequency um, also went down. So even if you're killed, if you've carried the symbiont, you sporulate with lower frequency, you're less likely 
to infect your co-clone mates. And of course, those co-clone mates are carrying the, um, are carrying the symbiont as well. So fast forwarding to today, we now know that there's a whole menagerie of symbionts infecting aphids out there. That's the name of the primary symbiont, which is essentially an organelle. It, um, its phylogeny is exactly congruent with that of the host. And then we have this zoo of other secondaries, including Hamiltonella, which is the one that Molly's lab showed protected against parasitoids, and Regiella that we showed protected against fungi. And we're still trying to investigate what the others do. Most of them are Enterobacteriaceae, but they, uh, they map onto uh, um, different parts of the prokaryote life cycle as well. Let me give you two examples of recent research from my group. So we've been systematically looking, about whether the, looking at whether the other symbionts have effects on, um, on resistance against fungi, and we are finding it. So if we just look at the top one, which is survival, in the abs the, the protocol is slightly different here. So it, it, it's, uh, the experimental pro protocol can tell apart the, uh, the effects of the symbiont a bit better. In the absence, if you have no symbiont, then you essentially die from the fungi. But a whole series of symbionts give protection, although not Hamiltonella. Hamiltonella on the right, that's the parasitoid one. And then within spiroplasma, then we have some strains that give protection, some don't. What we're trying to do at the moment is to sequence all these different symbionts to see whether there, is, whether there are sort of cassettes in common, whether there's a common mechanism. We still don't understand the mechanism of protection against fungi. Uh, we've also been working on some of the parasitoids as, as well. So here are the um, members of the two main groups of parasitoids that attack aphids, the Braconids, the Aphidius at the top and this cute little uh, Aphelinus at the bottom. And uh, recently, Elsa McLean in my lab has found some interesting results. So we have strains of the Hamiltonella that we have collected from aphids that are feeding on rest harrow and known as at the top, and essentially they have little effect on proportion parasitism. So that level, sort of 75 or 90% es escaping, it, it makes very little uh, difference. But then we have some strains which are very good at protecting against Aphelinus and poor against Aphidius, and the other way around. And interestingly, these strains are correlated with the food plant upon which the aphid feeds on. And this is one other, oh, sorry, just to summarize on the symbionts and the natural enemies there. So we now know that many different symbionts have effects on parasitoids and fungi, and work in particular from Kerry Oliver has actually found out how it works. It involves phages that deliver eukaryote toxins. And then we have different symbiont species can protect against the same natural enemy. And then we have this variation within symbiont species that is associated with host plants. And this is the other bit of the complexity of the P. aphid. The P. aphid consists of a series of races that are specialized to various extents on different host plants. Some might actually be different enough to be full species. Others are much more, uh, more, more uh, similar. And we've been exploring using a big panel of 1,100 aphid clones collected from many host plants all around the world exactly how the aphid phylogeny matches onto host plant use. If you do a phylogeny, actually this is based on the Butner regime, then you find that there is some conservatism of host plant use, but there is some mixture. It appears that the genes that um, enable you to use a particular host plant, there are sort of small number of cassettes that can introgress into different, into different groups. If you take the four most common symbiont types, and these are haplotype maps where the different colors are different host plants, you find substantial structuring due to uh, host plant use. And again, what you can do is you can look at the, how the phylogeny of the aphid and the phylogeny of the symbiont, how they interact there. And that's one for Hamiltonella, and that's one for Regiella. In Regiella, you can see particularly this association with the uh, biotype feeding on, uh, on clover. And then you can do some of the analysis. You can do experiments, so you can try and shift the symbiont composition and see if it affects host plant use. 
But curiously, while you get very clear results when you do equivalent experiments for um, natural enemies, it's much more complicated with host plants. But what we found, and this is work from Lee Henry, is that using ancestral state reconstruction, we find that if you get particular, if you acquire particular symbionts, then this increases your probability of colonizing, of being associated with a new host plant. And clearly, this is a correlational study, so you have to be cautious about causation. But it does look that if you acquire Hamiltonella, you're more likely to colonize Trefoil and, and um, Rest Harrow. And if you acquire one of the two main clades of Regiella, you're more likely to colonize Trifolium. And the last part there is that there is two symbionts which seem to synergistically work together to protect against certain types of parasitism. And quite nicely, we were able to pick out that, uh, that synergy from the phylogeny as well. The other point that comes from this work is that the major clade, clades are quite old, much older than host plant races. And, so, ooh, something's gone wrong here, never mind. Um, and so, it immediately makes you wonder what happens if you go from P. aphid to the whole community of aphids. Uh, and that is a PowerPoint glitch, but you can see there, there are uh, a little over 100 aphid species, and we use barcoding for this around the edge. And you can see the association of the major symbionts. And there is some major phylogenetic structure uh, in that. Um, a technical thing is that most of what we know about symbionts come from the P. aphids, so an immediate question is, are there some other things out there, or are the primers that you've developed from the symbionts that attack the P. aphids, will they work in other parts of the clade? And so we've done some next-gen sequencing to look at that. And essentially, we think we've discovered most of the major symbionts, at least in the, uh, in the, aphid, uh, uh, in the aphid clades that we've looked at. In, in Europe. And let me give you one example of a result coming out of that. I'm rather frightened to talk about insect ant association speaking just before Naomi Pierce, so I hope she won't find problems with this. So what we looked is the probability of a species being infected uh, by Hamiltonella and Regiella, depending on whether they were a species that was typically tended or not tended by ants. And the probability, the significance test in there, takes into account all the complex phy phylogenetic effects. And what we find is that if you're not tended by ants, you're more likely to um, carry Hamiltonella, where, whereas there was no effect for Regiella. So what we think here is that aphids can have alternative mutualism, alternative mutualists to help defend them from parasitoids, either ants, or, um, or um, the, uh, the symbiont. So just to summarize this, um, it, it's amazing. Aphids are the major pest of temperate agriculture, probably the single most important press, uh, uh, pest of temperate agriculture. And much of what we thought we knew about their biology 15 years ago, uh, we're far less certain about today. Symbionts are much more important, certainly in aphids. And I think increasingly we're finding that in other eukaryote systems. Um, secondary symbionts, they provide a reservoir of adaptations that the aphids can sort of sample from. Our sort of working model on this is that it's a bit like bacteria sampling uh, plasmids um, from, different, uh, uh, from different communities. So they're a sort of horizontal gene pool, rather like the, uh, the um, plasmids are a horizontal gene pool. And then uh, I've just mentioned there's evidence of alternative uh, defense systems. So, last couple of, of slides. Um, when we started off, as I said, we didn't use barcodes uh, at all. And um, I think one of the questions that we ask ourselves now is that if we had better taxonomic identifications, would it have affected that some of the food web metrics that we've used to compare food webs in the past? And I, I've showed you two experiments that haven't worked. I haven't showed you the 50 or 60 that didn't work. If we had that, um, if we, it wasn't quite that many, just before those of you doing Bonferroni corrections in your head. <laughs> if we had better taxonomic information, 
would we have um, designed those experiments to look at apparent competition better? Now, I'm slightly comforted this by work that uh, Thomas Roslin has done, who's taken, in fact, some of the leaf miner communities that we have studied as well, and he's found that, at least in a well-studied fauna in Europe, the morphological taxonomy is pretty good. And I think the real thing that I would like to see as a, a community ecologist is this continuing trend towards robotic, cheap, really high throughput barcoding, so that we can identify vast numbers of specimens very quickly. Um, a lot of the work I've shown you on the symbiont structure and the PAFID structure has been sort of below uh, barcode resolution, so we've used multi-locus sequence typing techniques. Um, the AFID symbiont community structure, we could have done it without barcoding in the UK, where essentially every species has been studied by a Victorian vicar, but it would have been much, much hard work uh, and I think if you're doing it in the less well-known uh, fauna, much, much harder. And I finish with an old hobby horse that I've gone on before. And last time, you were kind enough to invite me to Guelph. You asked me to talk about this. So barcoding and many of the other molecular techniques are going to render obsolete many of the sort of craft skills of taxonomy, building phylogenies, doing identifications and things. Um, but a barcode bin is valuable, and you can do some sort of macroecological macro things. But it's of limited use. It's even of limited use if you have a Linnaean name to it. And so I, I just think there's a real need for taxonomy to reinvent itself as a sort of custodian of the information space, as a science of biodiversity. And so my, my last slide is two things. First of all, to thank the organizers for inviting me here. And to say what I hope will happen in the next 10 years is that we take this, these sort of bare phylogenies and bin numbers and things, which are hugely, hugely useless, uh, useful. And we... <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I started off by disgracing myself, and I finished by disgracing myself. <laughs> which are hugely, hugely useful, but we need to populate them with this rich biological um, knowledge and hopefully this will work. So we want to transform the bare phylogeny into the rich biological phylogeny. Thank you very much. We have about four minutes for questions. For Charles, any questions? Please. Hello, my question is that did you find any symbiont which would deter the hyperparasitoids? Because that would be much more important, particularly in case of uh, FEDS, you know that mid season hyperparasitoids take over the primary parasitoids. So I think that if there is a symbiont which deters the hyperparasitoids, it is much more meaningful in the field. Um, we, we have a paper which is um, we, we're just writing up at the moment, and we've done it with one group of the hyperparasitoids, the Alexistine chiripids, and we found no effect for that. We don't think there'll be effect on the hyperparasitoids that attack the mummy, because by that time it's a sort of dead mass of, of aphid. But that's a neat question, and we have looked at that quite recently. Any questions? So, so oh. <laughs> So you've provided a great example of the way that barcoding can enrich an ecological study and, and vice versa. How do we operationally and pragmatically better cross the, the gap between the ecological community today and the barcoding community? How do we increase those synergies? The we as biologists are spoilt these days by the uh, resources that we can access from our desktop computers, especially the molecular resources. Um, I think that in order to get the ecological and evolutionary community really lining up behind uh, Paul's wonderful speech on, on the first day, that one, one needs to be able to present the wonderful summation of 250 years taxonomy in a form that's much, much easier 
to, um, to access. And I think until that happens, until um, an ecologist can, and we're spoiled, we shouldn't be doing this, until we can get that, that information, it's going to be hard for that community to be really arguing for many of the things that, that you want. So, um, and again, forgive me, this is a rusty needle, as I've talked about it before. These really rich um, web-based taxonomy resources, which uh, um, allow someone from the outside to access all that corpus of knowledge. Hi, uh, you said uh, uh, some of the symbionts you know, protect aphids from the, uh, um, the fungus and natural enemies. Can you comment on the, with respect to pest management strategies, this problem in pest management strategies? Yes. Um, for the majority of aphid problems in temperate, high input agriculture, um, it's, um, I'm unclear whether there is direct implications for, uh, uh, for it. Uh, in some of the greenhouse uh, systems where one is trying to do a highly biological control, then I think it would be helpful for you to know the, um, the symbiont status of the, major, uh, of the major pest. Now, actually, in those circumstances, the major pest is Mises persicae, the peach potato aphid, and curiously, it's a very small, horrible aphid. Um, curiously, that has a lower frequency of symbionts than any of the, of the bigger ones that, that, that we've looked at. Uh, we're exploring some of the relationships both with um, virus transfer and with insecticide resistance at the moment. But so far, I'd be sort of fibbing if I said that we've come out with some really important applied conclusions. Thank you so much. Paul. So aphids are interesting organisms that are just flooded with energy. All of these carbohydrates, they just don't know quite what to do with it, so they leak it, and you know they seem to be quite an attractive magnet for symbiotic organisms of one sort or another. So I'm quite interested, you mentioned a little bit about placing this in a, in a broader phylogenetic context. How many other organisms are, have, have tissues that are flooded with equally protective organisms, do you think? I mean, when I think about encountering a, a flu or a bacterium, I'm not necessarily thinking about my endosymbionts protecting me from it. So the question is, how broad is this, is this pattern? Is it something to do with the fact that uh, the breeding system of aphids, this clonal selection mechanism? Thank you. Um, I, taking your last question first, um, th there's a sort of control for that because one can look at other homopterans which don't have the, that breeding system. And so the white flies and, and, uh, and some of the other bugs, they're chock full of symbionts as well. I think that in insects that feed on nutritionally unbalanced food, so you're right, it's full of carbohydrates, poor proteins, low in, in, in amino acids, then they tend to have obligate symbionts, as do, for example, blood feeders. And I think that they are pre-adapted to host these facultative communities. So I think they are more common on those groups that also have obligate symbionts. Um, I think um, when groups have begun to look at the gut symbionts of other things, for example, ants, and Naomi will know much more about this that, uh, uh, than me, then I think they're finding lots of interesting interactions there. And then we only have to look at Wolbachia. So Wolbachia, which is present in a very large, significant fraction of organisms and has this bizarre set of effects. Um, that, to me, suggests that there is a lot out there. And one of the exciting things about next generation sequencing is that we are getting to a stage where, essentially, you don't have to have that happenstance of finding a Wolbachia or a Cardinium and then finding it everywhere. We can now systematically search a group and see, well, is there any, is there any sort of smoking gun symbiont there that we may have overlooked? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think Charles is a bit. I think Charles was a bit scared because he suggested that he, if he goes over time, we'll have a rappy scrum taking him off the stage, but he doesn't know how bad South African rugby is. So. 
So our next speaker uh, is Naomi Pierce from Harvard University, Microfile Communities of African Ant Plant, Pachilia Trepanopolium. Oh, no. Uh, I think it's just because maybe. It, it doesn't seem to be reading the laptop as it was. <laughs> it was. Do you think it's because this one is hooked up? Or? No, no, no. It, I disconnected it. Oh, good. Very good. Okay. And and this advances it. Uh, or, it oh, I do it. Okay. So we can start. Uh, um, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here, and uh, I'm happy to talk about some of this work. And uh, thanks for a kind of nice introduction to what I plan to talk about from uh, from Charles uh, Godfrey. Um, I, uh, when asked to, to give a talk here, I thought about, you know, how are we using barcodes right now? And this, uh, this is my title, and I will get to this in a minute. But uh, in fact, uh, my, my lab, the research in my lab has uh, totally changed really with the, with the DNA revolution, as it were, and uh, uh, partly because we could use DNA to reconstruct phylogenies, um, and, uh, um, and, but using DNA means using barcodes at many different levels. And I, so one of the points that I'd like to make in sort of a conversation that uh, um, uh, I'm sure we'll have is that barcodes, the, the standard CO1 barcode, of course, we've used a great deal of, but, but I, I think of many other kinds of barcodes now that uh, we use for, using, for looking at different taxa. So it was about 10 years ago, I guess, that Corey Moreau came to my lab and we started to work on the phylogeny of the ants. Um, and uh, um, uh, the main uh, point from this slide is really, um, uh, or the main point from this tree was that the take home message for us was first that the ants are very old, much older than people had uh, thought um, uh, previously, uh, and uh, um, Corey and I still stand by that. This tree was very well calibrated with um, with, with fossils. Um, but also, uh, if you see this green bar in the middle here, uh, um, this that green bar represents the rise of the angiosperms. And you can see in this um, in this lineage through time plot here that uh, that the ants really diversified with the flowering plants. Um, and that very much surprised both of us, I guess, because we had um, some uh, prejudices about the idea of ants being scavengers or predators or so on. But flowering plants, of course, you can go back and you can say, with hindsight, yes, a more diverse world. They were feeding on insects that fed on those plants. Uh, there, there are many possibilities. Um, we were also interested in, um, in uh, bacterial associations with ants. And it was a, a, a suggestion from Nancy Moran in a casual dinner conversation that got us going, looking at the gut symbionts of ants. Um, uh, Nancy looked at me and said, you have the genomic DNA, why don't you take a look? Um, and so we did. A, a postdoc came from uh, Nancy's lab, Jake uh, Russell, and he screened, um, and this was before next-gen sequencing, he screened 
the, um, hundreds and hundreds of samples. Um, and this was all done by cloning and sequencing, cloning and sequencing. We had in that phylogeny um, two thirds of the representatives or two thirds of the genera of ants. So this was a this was no mean feat. Um, but uh, he had a very nice result, which is that um, he found many um, uh, bacteria that were in a specialized clade, specialized um, uh, by ants. So there were Tetrapona associates here and Cephalotiny associates here. Um, the, the convention here is this is the bacterial phylogeny, but it's, it has the name of its host um, there. So, so the, these, were, these were clades of um, uh, bacteria. They were in the order Rhizobiales, um, uh, uh, although rather very distantly related to Rhizobium, but, but, um, but in fact, um, Here's where maybe my, my own limited uh, microbial background at the time helped because I, I saw this rhizobiales and I had been very interested in a report um, uh, from Tetrapona of nitrogen fixing bacteria in the guts of Tetrapona. Um, and so we decided to use this rhizobiales as an indicator um, uh, to look at um, how this distributed across the, the whole uh, clade of the ants. And as you can see here, um, uh, Jake found five independent evolutions of this trait of having rhizobiales on board, um, bacteria on board. Um, but, the, but the other thing that characterized these groups of ants um, that had the rhizobiales is that they were characterized using stable isotopes as, as being um, herbivorous or plant feeding. This means mostly feeding on plant exudates or nectar feeding. Um, uh, nectar is, is rich in carbohydrate, very poor in protein. Um, so, uh, so we were um, amazed and thrilled when we found this very strong association right across the phylogeny of the ants. There are many hundreds of species involved in this. And what I would say is that we more or less stumbled across the legumes of the ants world. I, I have always thought of ants as being very much like plants. They grow like plants. They're sort of, as the workers go out and forage, they're sort of like the cells of plants. And uh, indeed, uh, we would say that having these symbiotic bacteria in their guts, so having to get bacteria on board, uh, may have facilitated this um, radiation of ants into poor, nitrogen-poor environments, such as the canopy. So, so in these five groups, I think three of them are highly specialized to feed in the canopy in these nitrogen-poor environments. Um, and it was another student, John Sanders, who has taken this work much further, um, studying uh, the, the cephalotiny, the turtle ants, um, uh, and, uh, and their uh, co-evolution um, between these ants and their microbiota. Uh, and in this case, um, he was fortunate that uh, recently a, a phylogeny of the cephal uh, cephalodes had, had come out, um, and his interest was to take the whole gut microbiota of the ants and look at how the whole community may have evolved across the phylogenetic tree. Um, and he was very careful about how he did this. He, he characterized um, the, the gut bacteria for the cephalodes, both by using a fluorescence technique to see how many bacteria are there, but also by using qPCR to quantify how many bacteria are in the guts. Is it is just a, a few, or, is, or actually, or they, do they have a lot of gut bacteria? And, um, and he confirmed very, uh, very beautifully um, in results like uh, too many I can show you that, that in fact they do, they are chock-a-block with, uh, with bacteria. Um, and uh, particularly um, these varicue microbes, um, uh, uh, as you can sort of see plotted here, this is for 18 different species that were all collected in the Sahado and in um, uh, uh, working with, the, uh, um, with others in, in Brazil. Um, and uh, um, I only make the point here that these are the 18 species. And these ones were ones that were taken out of ethanol. So you can see, and these were all had the gut dissected and looked at fresh. So you can see that there are some interesting um, uh, ascertainment effects from how you pickle your ants, um, uh, but that uh, gets us onto a, another subject. So, so John characterized his bacteria in the guts of the uh, cephalodes, um, and then he went on to look at, at how did they co how did they diversify across the phylogeny of the ants. So he had the phylogeny of, of Cephalodes, and then he, he mapped the phylogeny of the bacteria. So, so here you see the bacterial phylogeny 
with the, um, the many different types. And the little blue bars here are actually um, a sort of shorthand for the phylogeny of the ants. And wherever you see many, uh, many uh, much blue mapped, it means that there was mapping of those bacteria onto that ant phylogeny. And wherever you see a red dot, it meant that he found a significant um, a significant signal of co-speciation between that, uh, the bacteria in the gut and, um, and the phylogeny of the ants. Now, um, this was an exciting result and still is very interesting to us because the age of, uh, the, of cephalodes is about the same as the age of mammals. I mean, they're about, these groups are, are uh, about the same age. And, and of course, for mammals, uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the work that's been done um, characterizing the microbiomes of different, different uh, vertebrate um, and mammal groups. Um, if we looked, if this were a tree of mammals here, you would not see all these red dots. There's, uh, there's very little co-speciation. Co of bacteria in the guts of mammals with their hosts. So something interesting and special is going on with the ants. We are also surprised because these gut bacteria are free living in the gut of the cephalodes. They are not uh, endosymbionts that would be automatically vertically transmitted. They are free living in the gut. And we think that the way in which they are transmitted for cephalodes is actually a behavioral trait um, the cephalodes engage in oral anal feeding like termites do, and uh, we think that that's been essential in this vertical transmission of uh, bacteria um, across, uh, uh, um, uh, down through the lineages. I mean, this is quite, a, it's, it's an old clade, and the, so to see that signature of co-speciation is really something. Um, and uh, what John uh, would posit, and I agree with him, and it's, uh, this is, uh, uh, but it's a still an open question, uh, and it uh, really goes after the question that, that uh, Paul Hubbard asked, is uh, how do you, so we have, we have bacteria in our guts, how, how can you recognize the good ones from the bad ones? Or how does the host recognize the good ones from the bad ones? Because some are pathogens and some are mutualists. And, and when we characterize the gut bacteria like this, how the heck do we tell the difference, even with our own bacteria? And, and, and what John would say is when you see this long pattern of co-speciation, um, it suggests that they've been associating for a very long time, and there's some stability to that over, over the ages. So those would be the bacteria to look at first for a poss possible mutualistic association. Um, and I think it's a great hypothesis uh, and, and worth uh, testing as he is doing looking at the primate lineage, of course, because that's a case where we might actually have a chance of knowing what some of these bacteria are doing using metagenomic te techniques. Okay, well, we don't always find patterns of speciation. Here's another example from my lab. About the same time when um, Corey came, uh, Santiago Ramirez came from uh, Colombia, and he was very interested in the evolution of of euglossing bees and in pollination relationships and, and uh, mutualistic relationships. He, he, he um, did a beautiful phylogeny of euglossines. And one of the great things about these little bees, of uh, many great things about them, um, uh, is that they, they uh, give you some behavioral um, clues. So they, they carry pollinaria from the uh, plants that they're um, pollinating on their, on their bodies. And um, uh, again, this was uh, how barcoding of a sort absolutely revolutionized what we could do behaviorally because um, uh, Santiago could use this barcode. And in this case, we, we needed two genes to be able to get uh, really, really, uh, or two gene markers to really go, um, go for this. But he was able to then capture many bees that had their pollinaria on their bodies. And here you can see all these little um, bunny ears. They're very cute. Um, the, the, this was the, uh, the, the group of pollinaria, and come up with a, um, a matching to the orchids that they belong to, and then look at how that matched with the phylogeny of the bees. Was it one, really, if you go way back in the textbooks, it was thought to be an elegant one-to-one -one matching with the, with an orchid pollination, pollinaria to, to orchid. Um, I, I don't think we would think this now, but we were very surprised at how reticulated this pattern was. There really didn't seem to be um, uh, much one-to-one -one matching at all here. Um, uh, but there are some very interesting things that came out of this. One thing that you might notice right away is that the bees are much older 
the bee clade is much older than this orchid um, clade that we're looking at. Um, that means that these bees evolved and in were, place, were in place long um, before the orchids began to diversify on that template. And I would say that this is a, uh, has been a common theme that we've seen in many mutualistic interactions of this sort when we've compared phylogenies, that is, one partner is, uh, tends to be older and, um, and more robust than the other in the sense that these bees may, may be able to live very well without the orchids, um, but the orchids can't live very well without the bees. Um, and uh, indeed, the or the, you can think of the bees as being a sort of ecological template against which the orchids have diversified. And this is, this is also true, for example, if we look at the ants and the lysinid butterflies that, um, uh, whose caterpillars, many of uh, the caterpillars of which associate with ants, they too have this kind of asymmetrical pattern of, um, of dependency uh, between the two groups. Moving on to an, another example that goes more into community ecology, a, a current student, Leo uh, Biddleston, has um, been looking at uh, the communities of pitcher plants. Um, and uh, I uh, particularly like this study because it, it has a, um, a sort of a ground truthing to, uh, to some of the molecular work we do. So she took three um, species of pitcher plants here found in, in um, Singapore, that, uh, <laughs> that wonderful uh, wild field site. Um, but I think she was waiting to get permits to go to Borneo. But so she sampled these three species and uh, looked at um, what was in there um, in the pitchers. Um, this is a much uh, deeper study, but I'll just talk about the insects because this uh, was so much fun. So, uh, um, so you can uh, look inside these the contents of the pitchers and see uh, the carcasses of insects that the, the uh, that have fallen in there. Some of them are inquilines that actually live in the pitchers and eat the prey, eat some of the prey that the that the uh, plant has captured. Um, and uh, um, and when we look down, we can count those. Uh, morphotypes for those uh, those insects in there, and uh, there are in this particular group of, of pitcher plants in uh, Singapore. There there are eight morpho morpho species. Um, well, she was able to then take the um, fluid from those. Uh, uh, pictures and um, uh, use a meta barcoding to look at how many arthropod OTUs or um, a taxonomic um, operational taxonomic units were inside those pitcher plants, and um, uh, uh, she found 189. Um, so it was a an, it was a pretty good, uh, to me, I thought, oh, that's possible. We've, we're seeing the traces of 189 arthropods that have been in or around, maybe digested by the plant or, or uh, related in some way to the inclines inside those pitcher plants. But uh, the nice thing is that for some of the taxa where we could identify the morpho species, there was actually a reasonable correlation between, um, between the number of OTUs for that taxa and, um, uh, the, and the counts that we made just by taking the pictures ourselves and counting the morphotypes for the insects. Um, although you can see here that mosquitoes and mites tend to be underrepresented in the data, but, um, but uh, many of the midges have a very good correlation. So it's a kind of a ground truthing for some of our molecular techniques. Um, she also did some ground truthing for the identification using barcodes um, uh, uh, from the 18S data for eukaryotes. She also sequenced uh, CO1, the standard barcode, to make sure that, and, and indeed there was a very, I think, quite a good matching between the insects that were in there um, and the, w the way in which we identified them. Um, of course, she's looked at uh, uh, many, many other things uh, in here. I can't go in to uh, discuss them all, but um, just to show one of these nice uh, bipartite uh, plots, as, uh, as Charles um, Godfrey did already, uh, this shows rather nicely, um, uh, it's, it's plotting the arthropods against the pitcher plants, and uh, it shows that there's a a significant association between the species of pitcher plant and the and the community of arthropods associated with it, and uh, the, you can see this perhaps a bit better in this uh, spring-loaded diagram that that gives you a sense of the of those of those OTUs that are unique to a given species and the ones that are shared uh, in the middle. Okay, well, I said I would talk about. Uh, 
about um, or macrophiles, and I, I will now in the last uh, 10 minutes or so, uh, um, we're now moving to Africa, um, which, uh, and to the uh, entomologist's delight, because um, you can see these um, balls hanging in the branches of the acacia tree. These are, these are the, the swollen thorn uh, um, demacia that the plant produces for the ant. Um, this is the work of uh, current students, um, uh, Dino, well, Dino Martins, who recently uh, left, who really brought the whole system to my lab. Uh, Dino comes from Kenya and emailed me and said, well, you'd better study this. And I had to agree with him. Um, Chris Baker, uh, who has done a huge amount of this work on myrmecophiles and on fungi, I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, Jack Boyle, who's been working on the population genetics of the ants. Julianne Pelliez and Laurie Shapiro, who've been looking at uh, some of the chemical ecology involved in helping with the field work. Um, it's, very, it's a great pleasure to talk about ant plants and mutualism with Dan Jansen in the audience because a lot of us were inspired to work on mutualism because of his uh, pioneering work uh, years ago looking at, uh, at using uh, ant plants as a model system for studying uh, mutualistic interactions. Um, there are many, uh, it's, this is a trait, um, um, a plant trait that's evolved many times in many different species of plants. Um, and, uh, um, uh, and yet they are, they are all restricted to tropical areas. Uh, an interesting uh, factoid that I'll come back to uh, at the end. Um, here, going to East Africa, it is tropical, but it's more a savanna. We're entering into the savanna where we evolved as a species. And here is um, uh, Acacia drapanolobium, or now called Vachelia drapanolobium, with its swollen thorns um, and antimatia. This is a dominant plant throughout East Africa, as far as the eye can see. This is looking across the Rift Valley. Um, wherever there are black cotton soils, you see these acacia drapanolobium, or um, Vachelia drapanolobium. Um, they, uh, up to 18 ant species have been recorded living in those swollen thorns, but really there are, um, uh, across the um, most populations, there are three dominant phytoecious ants. Uh, phytoecious means that they're only found, these species are only found inside these, uh, the, this ant plant. They're not found free living. There is one other that, uh, that's uh, located in um, Impala that is a, a free living one. And it's a, a straightforward uh, house and food in exchange for defense against her, um, herbivores um, mutualism. Um, uh, there's been legions of work done on ecological work done on this system by uh, Truman Young, who really started it, Mo Stanton, Todd Palmer, Rob Pringle, um, and others who have looked at some of the costs and benefits of associating with uh, different ants in the system. So that was very uh, helpful when we started, it's still helpful in, in being able to study aspects of it. Um, uh, Dino Martins did a beautiful uh, work where he showed that um, the ants, even these very small ants, can be extremely effective against these rather uh, large browsers like uh, the giraffe, which approach the ant um, the plants inhabited by the three different ant species equally, um, but, uh, but will not browse on the one with uh, um, uh, chromatogaster mimosae, which is the most pugnacious of the defenders. Um, uh, this wimpy um, uh, tetrapona repensigi that never does a thing and seems to not deter uh, the browsers at all um, and has been quite a mystery. Okay, so this system has many third party associates. Um, and uh, um, we, of course, became interested in this, not the least be because if you open up some of these demacia, you can see here these uh, two nice polymorphic uh, lysinid caterpillars inside. The caterpillars of many butterflies in the lysinidae associate with ants. They can chemically fool the ants into favorable recognition where the ants will actually tend and protect them instead of recognizing them as uh, potential um, uh, enemies. And uh, there are many Lycaenid butterflies that parasitize this ant, uh, ant plant system. Uh, here are just four of them, but uh, um, uh, Dino and, uh, and, and others have documented up to 45 different species. Um, there are weird and wonderful flies in there. If you uh, open, open up these, uh, uh, the, the demacia, there are also zoraptorins that feed on fungi inside some of these demacia. 
Um, there are beetles and flies that range the, um, from being um, um, mutualistic, apparently mutualistic interactions with the ants, uh, to parasitic. So we wanted to do a survey uh, to see you know, how much is really in there, because uh, all the focus so far has been on these large browsers. What about the things coming from inside? Um, uh, and to do that survey, we went out and cut down small plants, took uh, all the dementia off them, um, uh, and sorted them. And then, uh, wonderfully, because in the past, these are mostly larval forms that we were finding in there. In the past, we would have never been able to identify what these things are. But of course, um, now we can. So um, uh, uh, by... Um, uh, pulling out OTUs or um, uh, barcode sequences and, uh, and then blasting them against uh, different databases, we're able to uh, identify what is inside these dementia. So um, here uh, is our data set from two field sites in Kenya, uh, Kitengela, which is outside of uh, Nairobi, and Suyan, which is in, the, in um, Laikipia, up near um, Pala, for those of you who've been there. Um, uh, the results of about look at, searching through about 22,000 dementia, we ended up with about uh, 2,000 some uh, myrmecophiles, and from those uh, identified 82 OTUs. Um, how did we do? Well, we estimate from this rarefaction curve that we probably we probably have identified about half the uh, OTUs that are present. So maybe maybe there. 100, 160 to 200 species there um, uh, in, in this system, or that's what we would estimate from two, from the, that's from two main field seasons of work. Um, here are some of the critters. Uh, we've taken them out and in all cases photographed them as well. And of course, um, uh, uh, looked at various aspects, much of which I can't talk about. Um, uh, you know, are, they, are there more myrmecophiles with one ant species than another? And yes, mimosi, even though um, if you control for dimension number and so on, it seems to have a much larger burden of myrmecophiles than the other two ant species. So, so I hope you see right away that there's an irony here. The, the, this is the most pugnacious ant that keeps things from, from browsing, and yet it's the one that's sort of parasitized the most by myrmecophiles inside the nest. Um, uh, myrmecophiles that, many of which are carnivorous inside the nest. Um, now we can, um, we can characterize the uh, ant communities in different ways. This is just a canonical uh, correspondence analysis that, that gives an ordination um, uh, uh, separating out the myrmecophiles. Each one of these dots represents a tree, um, uh, and uh, this represents, uh, pulls out the ones for the different, uh, um, uh, inhabited by the different ant species so that we can better look at their ecology. And indeed, there are significant communities of myrmecophiles that are specialized with particular ants. And just to give you an example of a few of these, um, uh, there are some generalists. So uh, 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 um, this uh, Galakiid is a, a generalist, and so oddly is this ant mimic. Um, but then we have others uh, that are specialists. Um, of course, the scale insects are huge specialists with mimosi. Um, and interestingly, the gastropod with the uh, um, with uh, pensigi and um, and uh, tortrissa there with the. Uh, um, uh, with, is specialized on, on the chromatogasters. So, so there, it's an uh, ecological playground here to look at some of these differences. We can, of course, also use the barcodes to establish life histories. So uh, David Agus, he had written a very nice paper where he described um, uh, different uh, moths that he'd reared from the acacias, but without um, uh, taking into account the ants that associated with them. And we can now match the larval forms of those uh, moths and their larval and pupil forms. Okay, well, um, much too much to talk about, and uh, I'll, I, I will move uh, quickly on um, for the myrmecophiles, though, simply to say that, that we, uh, there's a, a great deal of variation, but we do get um, interesting specialization and, uh, on, on different ant hosts. But that's not the only thing that's inside this, uh, inside this um, 
these dematia. And um, one of the reasons we got interested in looking at one other feature in the dematia is because of the wimpy uh, tetraponer ants that I mentioned before. Um, uh, Dino had long wondered about them because they were, he never saw them out there protecting, he never saw them attacking a herbivore at all. And yet when he reared them in the lab, they showed an uncommon interest in, uh, in um, uh, fungi and in harvesting fungi. Um, and uh, um, I'm, I'm almost done. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and indeed, uh, here you can see that if you offer them fungi, they will harvest um, a great, uh, uh, harvest a great deal more than the other ants. Well, of course, we could use the same amplicon sequencing techniques to look at what, at what was in there. Um, and uh, I, I'd like to think of the different ants on the different plants as, as, as exhibiting a sort of extended phenotype where the, uh, um, the dematia itself becomes like an extended phenotype that's good for growing uh, particular cocktails of fungi. Um, and we could sample these and also the ones that we grew in our greenhouse that uh, was outside of the spore rain of fungi um, available. And here you can see that we got very uh, big differences in, um, in, uh, in diversity. Uh, so the leaves have the greatest diversity of fungi, um, uh, but, and the greenhouse had almost none. This is a greenhouse in North America. Um, uh, but what about the communities of fungi? Do they sort out by ant? And the answer to this is yes, absolutely they do. We got uh, uh, Tetraponera has a very typical community that's separate from the um, Nigriceps, that's separate from the, from the Mimosi. Um, and we can uh, even twirl them around and look at them uh, this way. Uh, we can uh, uh, culture them too. Um, Here's a bar bipartite graph again showing you that their specialization um, and that we can culture them. These are the ones we have in culture. And what we would like to do now, of course, is go back and see what effect do these, do these fungal communities have on the plants that they're in. Um, I add one last thing, which is that um, with Johann Billen, we looked at the uh, infrabucal pockets of the ants and found that the alates of, um, uh, in this case, nigriceps, were carrying all of the fungal diversity that are found inside the dematia. Um, and uh, I, I hope you know why we find that exciting. Um, it, how does the fungus get into the dematia in the first place? Well, the queens burrow their way in. Okay, so uh, the take home message from all of this is that we really uh, need to think about these, um, uh, uh, this mutualism. Now, if we think of it as a guild of interacting species, um, uh, uh, we need to take into account these third parties. Um, uh, I gave the example of Mimosi before, but here's another, here's, a, here's something to go home with and think about. Let, let's imagine that what the real mutualism in ant plant mutualisms is actually between the fungal community and the plants. If the fungal community uh, in, uh, inside an ant plant encourages it to grow better, then, um, then the ants may simply be a vector to carry that fungal community. This is a mutualism enhancing mutualism. And of course, ant plants are only found in the tropics. Maybe, <coughs> maybe that has, and as Doug tells us, that you, the more tropical you are, the better you are at uh, having fung fungi present in wood. So perhaps, uh, perhaps there's, there's something to that. Okay, and I will end now uh, with a note on barcodes, which is that they're fantastic identifiers because they, um, they, you can use them to identify both pattern and process. And the reason you can is because, the, as, um, since it's DNA, um, you, can, you can use them both as markers to identify things, but also to reconstruct phylogeny um, uh, and uh, evolutionary history. And I, I know I'm preaching to the converted here on this, but we've been able to use that in many different ways in my lab uh, to, to characterize these symbiotic uh, interactions that undoubtedly have uh, promoted uh, terrestrial diversity. And uh, with that, uh, I will stop. So thank you very much. Sorry, I don't make it. Thank you very much. We'll take one question because we, we're behind time. On the floor. Any questions? Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you. So our last talk of the session is from Jana Vamosi from the University of Kalpari in Canada with a very interesting title, Insights from the Tree of Sex, Why So Many Ways of Doing It. Thank you. Is the mic on all right? Can you hear me? Let me know if you can't hear me. Okay. Uh, all right, well, um, I'd like to start off just by um, thanking the organizers once again. It's, it's um, been a real pleasure to, to be here and hear all of your talks as well. Um, so I wanted um, to use this opportunity to tell you guys a little bit about some of the insights uh, from the tree of sex. Um, so what I mean by that um, is um, that uh, there is a tree of sex consortium um, that's been going on at Nescent. And this is a group of international collaborators um, that have come together uh, to try to understand the evolutionary dynamics of sexual systems. Um, and I wanted to talk to you today about it because it's been very central in opening my eyes um, to what sort of biases uh, we might be use, um, incorporating into our understanding of the natural world when we take our inferences from a very small subset of biodiversity. And this is what I think barcodes can really um, contribute to and really um, start making a dent in. And I think uh, what I mean is quite uh, well exemplified by this figure, Will Cornwell made it. This is just sort of the story in the plant world. If you uh, think about um, how much biodiversity we think exists um, with the light blue circle, that's a very wide circle. There's a lot of biodiversity. The darker blue circle that you see there is how many we've actually attributed a name to. Um, if you start thinking about how many species we actually have some genetic data for, that's this even darker circle here. If you look then at the tan circle, that is the um, species for which we actually have some information of the function of the traits that those species have. And then once again, in the Venn diagram style, if you start looking at what subset of species we actually had this perfect storm where we actually know what the species is, has some genetic data available for it, and also have some information on the traits and the functionality of some of those traits, you start really shrinking the number of species for which we can actually ask a lot of questions for. And so the Tree of Sex Consortium, with its sensational name, um, wanted to approach this question um, asking the question about sexual system evolution. So if your educational trajectory was anything like mine, um, then you were probably introduced to your first sexual system probably somewhere in high school, where is there working there, where you were um, sort of giving your first Punnett squares to try to work out um, how inheritance would work in a sex-linked trait. And then you were informed that males um, were XY and females were XX. And so if um, a trait was on the X chromosome, it had different inheritance patterns depending on whether a male or a female arose. Um, so uh, then, you know, life sailed along with you probably thinking that that was the predominant system. Uh, somewhere in undergrad, some professor may have introduced you to the fact that actually the XY's um, sex determination system isn't the only sex determination system out there, that birds and butterflies um, had the heteromorphic sex chromosome switched. And it's the females that were the ZW, and the males then have two Z chromosomes. So glad I'm in Canada now talking about this because the Americans always tease me about my pronunciation of Z. So for all the Americans, that's Z. So that 
at sometimes it's sort of the end of your education on sex determination systems. But in actual fact, sex determination systems are far more variable out there. We end up just focusing our studies just on the ones that are these sort of common ones. And it gives us this perception that it is difficult and rare to transition between sex determination systems. They evolve rarely, and because they're so important for reproductive fitness, the um, clade ends up getting stuck in that state, or that can be the perception that you had. So I wanted to tell you some about um, some of the insights that we've gotten from the tree of sex by making this grand compilation of sex determination systems. And first, I'll just talk about the first one there, is just how much variation do we really have in sex determination systems? So uh, we ended up finding out that the answer is quite a bit. So this is open data. Anybody can use this. We have compiled data on 12,000 different species um, from all historical records on what is actually determining sex. I've just showed you the uh, vertebrate summary um, slide here. Um, where you can see that, of course, the classic systems that we're accustomed to, here's mammals here with blue, they are indeed all XY. And it does stay constant in that clade. Um, here we have the bird segment. And the, um, the, the red is sort of showing you the, the ZW system. And yes, it's all constant there. But in lots of part of the tree of life, we have tons of variation. Here you can see them flickering about between ZW and XY systems. So that's reptiles there. Here's fish, again, flickering in between lots of transitions between XY and ZW systems. Turns out it's extremely constant. Or it turns out it can be constant in some clades and very variable in others. So here's just sort of the pan uh, summary of all of the clades for which we have data for on the Tree of Sex um, Consortium website. So here we have, again, mammals. They're all XY. Birds, sure, they're all ZW. But here, in the majority of the rest of the Tree of Life, we have tons of variation. Actually, transitions are relatively common. So when you sort of figure out that constancy in the sex determination systems is actually a myth, you can then start to ask some really interesting questions on well, what are the genomic backgrounds upon which transitions between these sex determination systems can actually occur. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about one example where we examine multiple chromosome systems. So you have to, of course, your sex chromosome system is very important for your reproductive success. Um, males have greater reproductive success when they're good males, and females have good reproductive success when they're good at being females. So this is, of course, very important for fitness. But you can have transitions between um, different sex chromosome systems. And one way in which you can do that is from a fusion between a sex chromosome and an autosome. So this is the model that's most commonly um, examined. And here you have your X chromosome here, your Y chromosome there, and you've got two autosomes that are lined up here. If you get a fusion between that Y chromosome and that autosome, you will end up going down this pathway here, and your sex determination system will change to what is known as a multiple chromosome system. You will end up with, instead of a little stubby Y, which you might sort of be familiar with, the Y will end up, because it still has that autosome tagged onto it, will be bigger. And you'll end up with two X chromosomes. X1, X2, Y would be the shorthand for that chromosome system. You don't have to fuse the autosome to the Y chromosome. You can fuse the X chromosome to an autosome. Then you go down this pathway here, and you'd wind up with a big X chromosome and two Y chromosomes. And X, Y1, Y2 would be the shorthand. You can do the exact same thing in a ZW system as well, but that has received a lot less attention. So typically, what people notice in terms of patterns is that this system here, going from an, an XY system 
to an X1, X2, Y chromosome system was the most common. And I think that was a, to a great deal because we sort of had tunnel vision and we're focusing all our attention on these XY systems. There was a lot of theory then that got generated on why X, Y, uh, on why Y autosome fusions were so common. And the story ended up um, being somewhat like this, uh, that this was due to sexual um, antagonistic selection because you can imagine that males that have stronger sexual selection put upon them. This is sort of our um, prevailing argument for why males end up um, having uh, ornamentation or large size. And you can imagine that there would be some genes that would be better for fitness on a male background, but would be poor for fitness on a female background. That's what sexual antagonism is and so the greater the difference between how much better a trait such as ornamentation or large size is for a male the more it would be better to put these two in combination so the autosome that hosts that gene that's good in males but bad in females and put it in combination and link it to a y chromosome could be beneficial for fitness and this was the prevailing theory on why, um, why autosome fusions were more common than X autosome fusions. So, and that seemed to fit with what was understood to be the empirical patterns because the focus was always on these XY systems. And indeed, in XY systems, Y autosome fusions are more common than X autosome fusion. So it seemed like sexual antagonism was the perfect answer, and there seemed to be broad scale agreement that this was what was going on. In uh, the Tree of Sex Consortium, we just kind of said, hey, we actually can test something here. We now compiled this great data set where we understand which of the species are actually a ZW system. If this theory is correct, that when you have great amount of sexual selection and it's better for the males to end up having the fusion um, with the genes that are good for sexual selection, well then it should work also in ZW systems, except it should be opposite in the sense that now, because the Z chromosome is more common in males, now we should be seeing that Z autosome fusions are more common than W autosome fusions. Perfect, let's test this because we actually have lots of variations in transition in fishes and squamate reptiles. So here's some um, reptiles here. They sort of had this perfect storm where we understood their traits. They definitely have a number of species where there's sexual selection. Males have the ornamentation. Females don't, uh, we had the genetic information, and now we had the sex determination system um, to put upon it. Fishes, we again had that perfect storm again where we had this collusion of all the different ingredients that we needed to ask this question. And so we did. Um, so here you can see the phylogeny of fishes in which barcodes are included. Um, so here the blue is showing you all of the different clades of fishes that have an XY system. The red is showing you all the clades of fishes that have these ZW systems. Um, and the black little flickers there are all of the clades where we see um, a fusion has occurred. Same thing, same color coding in the squamate reptiles. Um, the red is the ZW, the blue is the XY. The black is showing you all the originations of these fusion events. Now, hopefully you can sort of just sort of look at that visual and see that now, um, the fusion events are still always upon the XY background. They don't seem to happen in ZW backgrounds. Uh, so that actually was against our prediction. We thought that they'd be absolutely fine in ZW systems. We just had a prediction of where they'd end up occurring. But no, it wasn't true. Actually, why autosome fusions, that's pretty much um, the predominant chromosome that gets fused to an autosome. 
Um, and it's not just a little bit higher, it's a lot higher. Um, so we actually had to sort of throw um, our entire arsenal of statistical analyses at this. We even had participants in the working group who didn't believe that this could possibly be true and thought that the phylogenies must be wrong uh, because the sexual antagonism theory just had so much weight behind it. Um, so this is a posterior probability distribution. This is the zero line of if you, the expectation if Y autosome fusions were, um, were just as common as any other fusion. Um, and here in the squamate reptiles in red, you can see that that frequency distribution where we're averaging over all of the uncertainty in the phylogenetic tree is far away from that zero line there. And so too is the posterior probability distribution of the fish as well. So this is quite a strong pattern that fusions occur more upon an XY background than any other. So it's always sometimes you know, disturbing when your predictions don't work out, but it also can be very enlightening as well. And so we actually sort of had to go back to the drawing board and ask, okay, well, what is different about an X, a Y, and a W, and a Z chromosome? What else is different? Um, and so some of the things that um, went into the brainstorming is that the numbers game is quite different. If you just even think about an XY system, there's a three to one ratio of X chromosomes to Y chromosomes in the population. And that can have some consequences as well. So, um, but they're almost against the predictions again. If you're actually just sort of thinking about the opportunities to fuse, well then the X chromosome should have three times the number of opportunities to fuse with an autosome than the Y chromosome. But the other thing that this sort of numbers game actually led us to is that when you're actually thinking about small population sizes, the Y chromosome has a smaller population size in the population than does the X chromosome. And when you start thinking about population size and small population size and how they can affect fitness, it's under those conditions when a deleterious mutation can get fixed in the population. So perhaps it was just that the Y chromosome had drift processes acting upon it more strongly. And so then that made us question this presumption that we had that a Y autosome fusion was actually a beneficial arrangement. All of the sexual antagonism theory actually was sort of built upon the fact that this would be a benefit to the male that then had put these genes in combination with one another. Then we actually went to the medical literature and sort of, you know, went outside our comfort zone and found that in the medical literature, fusions are quite understood to be deleterious in terms of their fitness effects. Um, so uh, uh, the most common um, fusions happen Chromosome 13 and 14 happens in about one every 1,000 newborns. Um, carriers of a fusion do okay. They can live a normal life, but suffer um, quite serious fertility problems. And these fusion events are thought to occur more often in males. And so we said, uh-huh. Um, and thought, okay, these drift processes actually could be the reason why uh, these Y autosome fusions are just getting fixed more often in males. That in combination with the fact that, of course, the gamete production in males and females, as we well know, is very different. Uh, males make very abundant, um, cheap sperm. Females make large um, and sort of comparatively expensive eggs. And so the DNA repair mechanisms in males might be somewhat more compromised um, than they are in females. When they're just sort of chugging out this sperm, there actually could be a higher mutation rate to um, produce these fusions in the first place in males. And from there, you can then adjust your models. This is sort of like this sort of uber Bayesian type of analysis here, where we looked at the empirical patterns and say, they don't fit our theories, and then we end up sort of changing our priors. So if you change your models and change your presumptions and actually model it so that a Y autosome fusion is deleterious 
rather than being beneficial, you can actually have the model quite easily produce data that looks fairly similar to what we actually do see in our empirical patterns. In actual fact, these small population sites with an increased mutation rate can easily um, come out with the uh, answer that the Y autosome fusions should be the most common type of fusion that we see. So, um, like I said, um, the tree of sex is, um, has a large uh, number of samples. It's not just invertebrates. We actually have data on invertebrates, and we have data on plants as well. So I'll turn my attention now to just some of uh, the other paradigms that we've seen to be overturning by sort of taking the blinders off and taking this really broad approach. Now, plants don't often have sex chromosome systems in the same way that animals do. Uh, but some plants do have a separation of their sexes. And this is a uh, sexual system known as diece um, in, in plants. Um, and here you have uh, a plant species where we have a female that uh, has nothing but female um, parts on her, and then a male plant that would be somewhat beside it. But of course, most plant species are hermaphroditic, where they have male and female uh, function on every individual. And it's uh, fairly well established that diece is rare. Um, so diece represents about 6% of all of the flowering plants. And the rest of them um, usually have some combination of their sexual function on each and every individual. So there's a number of reasons why this could be true. Um, and we sort of went through with our data set trying to get a process of elimination to find out why diece might be rare. So the first one is that diece might be rare because the conditions that foster its evolution all also are rare in the natural world. And that would just make the diece evolves really rarely. Um, certainly, that is one um, possibility. The second is that diece might evolve quite readily, but it might be what is considered an evolutionary dead end. So once you do evolve diece, that's sort of the end of the line. You're stuck in that sexual system, and perhaps they experience increased extinction rates or lowered speciation rates. And the third one that hadn't been explored very much at all was that it, diece perhaps evolves quite readily, but it just is transitory. It evolves right back to the original state fairly rapidly as well. So going through these, the first one is just that perhaps um, diece just doesn't evolve very often. Um, so like I said, this is again this sort of summary slide that we have um, from the Tree of Sex um, Consortium, and that doesn't seem to be the case at all. If I just draw your attention to this red outer ring here, that's all of the plant species that have that hermaphroditic sexual system. So male and female function on each and every individual. But then if you look at the purple flickers here, that's all the independent originations of diece that we think exist as well. And there are plenty. Now, this wasn't terribly exciting. People have known for quite some time that there are many originations of diece. So this, this sort of just confirmed the outlook that we had before. So eh, process of elimination, that does not seem to be a contributing factor to why diece is so rare. So looking at the second one then, whether maybe diece evolves quite readily, but ends up being some sort of evolutionary dead end, um, is, is what we then looked at um, next. And so there's a number of different ways in which you can get from a starting point, if you imagine it to be hermaphroditic. I think my pointer went out. Okay, well, on the left-hand side, you can see, oh, sorry. Thanks. There you go. So that's a hermaphroditic state. You've got male and female function. And there are a number of different pathways that can get you from here all the way to a dioecious state. And these have been well researched. So looking at our data set now, we found 44 different genera uh, for which we had a combination of states. So again, this sort of combination, this perfect storm where we had ever, all the raw ingredients 
that we needed to test um, some of these ideas. So this is a uh, Circium here. All of the gray ones are hermaphroditic species, and the blue ones are the dioecious species that are just in this genus. Um, and from looking at this in a phylogenetic comparative manner, you can look at the transition rates from the hermaphroditic state and see how many of them are then going towards the dioecious state. And you can also test that against the estimate of the uh, rate in which it can go back. So what is the rate in which it can go from a dioecious state and get to a hermaphroditic state? And we did that 44 times in the 44 genera for which we had this combination of traits. What we found, though, is, in, is here's one example here doing the same thing with a posterior um, probability distribution. This is the transition rate of evolving from a hermaphroditic state and going towards diocese, and that is the transition rate from going from diocese back again to hermaphroditism. And those two frequency distributions completely overlap. And that isn't uh, any sort of exception to the rule. In actual fact, we found that in our 44 genera, in only two of them could we see that there was differential transitions going from hermaphroditism or a non dioecious state to a dioecious state. And in a great many of them, the majority of them, the transition rates going back and forth um, were uh, equivalent. Further to that, even when you look at our own graph, um, we had this starting state of hermaphroditism with unidirectional arrows going towards diece, as though that's the only way you can go. If that were the fact, you would expect that diece would always just be on the tips of the phylogeny, and you wouldn't be able to get back. We actually found um, that in one third of the genera, um, the root state was actually dioecious. Um, so that doesn't seem to be the case at all, that diece is a trait that is correlated with higher extinction rates. So here in this picture here, this color coding, the redder those bars are, the higher the probability we have that the root state is actually dioecious. So we were actually somewhat embarrassed. Our own sort of thinking and presumptions on how the system worked actually were overturned. This is our own figure, and we assume that you, you start here, and you go here, you can't go back. And so we sort of did our own figure with unidirectional arrows, uh, which we are now sort of thinking, oops, um, actually this going backwards and going the other way is just um, as much as an evolutionary probability. Um, so through this process of elimination, we ended up having the most confidence that actually dicey is rare because it evolves readily but it evolves right back to a non dioecious state just as fast. Um, so to conclude, I just sort of uh, like to make the argument um, that taking a broad perspective is um, a healthy thing to do, and it can really change your ideas on how the natural world, uh, how it actually works and how it actually functions. Um, and understanding those function, functions of the traits um, can, can be a good way, a good platform for argumentation on why we need to understand biodiversity. And I think that's definitely something um, that barcodes can, can have a lot to say on the matter. Um, and with that, I'd like to um, thank you for being here. I'll take any questions. Sure, okay. Um, can I please ask you for tea time, or um, can you just grab a cup of coffee and make sure that you're back here in 15 minutes so that we can start on time? And then lastly, I just want to thank the speakers of this morning for their very stimulating presentations. I think we can give them another round of applause. Thanks. Oh, yeah, sorry. Thanks for that. Sorry about that. I didn't want to interrupt, but there was another pointer. And oh, there was? Yeah, this big thing. Oh, that thing. Oh, I didn't get the
conversation of the morning ecological and environmental genomics. But before we start, can I just ask the speakers of yesterday and this morning to search their pockets because we're missing some of the clips of the microphones. And I've been told if we don't find them, we will start searching in your pockets. <laughs> So the first talk will be by Mark Blackster of the University of Edinburgh on metabarcoding and myofauna and other eukaryotes in terrestrial and marine ecosystems. So it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, uh, thanks especially to Merdad and Paul for inviting me. And I hope I, hope I can... Um, entertain you for 25 minutes. I'm going to talk about nematodes, uh, my favorite small beast. Um, ought to be all your favorite small beasts as well. Many of you have been hosts to nematode parasites at some time in your youth. Maybe some of you are carrying them now. Um, and um, if you ever want to barcode something that you know somebody has never barcoded before, barcode a nematode because um, they are severely neglected. So um, I'm going to start with uh, the thanks um, this, this work was done by a, an undergrad, the work, the bit of science I'm going to talk about rather than, rather than uh, thoughts and ideas was done by an undergraduate student, Clara Flintrop, who is now off doing a, a marine biology diversity master's course and was done in collaboration with Martin Jones, a biomedician in our institute. I work with a team of, of wonderful genome uh, technologists at Edinburgh Genomics and Marion Thompson helped us very much with this. Okay, this is a quote from um, Nathan Cobb in an obscure journal uh, published in the, in the US. And he imagined taking away the entirety of the planet except for nematodes. He was a parasitologist. He was trying to emphasize that these nematodes were everywhere and that you'd still be able to see all the land masses, but you'd especially still be able to see the plants because they're infested with nematodes and the animals. You maybe you wouldn't see the entirety of the animal, but you'd see animals wandering around, the guts of the animals wandering around with their parasites inside. Now, the wonders of modern technology means that we can now do this. Um, Nathan Cobb's absolutely right. Nematodes are incredibly abundant. And there's a wonderful series of studies done in uh, the ex-Soviet Union, uh, Platnova and Valisova, who counted hundreds of thousands of myobenthic, that's tiny, about one millimeter body length organisms, in the White Sea, the beaches of the White Sea, and decided that nematodes corresponded to about 95% of the organisms they picked out of the White Sea. Uh, John Lambshead has done similar calculations and estimated that of all the animals on the planet, this is including the arthropods, of all the animals on the planet, most of the individuals are nematodes. So nematodes rule, simply. I've got, I've got my Society of Nematology t-shirt on just to prove it. In terms of species, we only have 23,000 described species. That number is going up year on year. There are still nematologists describing species. The estimates of the number of nematode species range from about 1 million, which is a, a reasonable and conservative estimate, to the original estimate that John Lambs had made in this Oceanus paper of 100 million. Um, I think the difference between those two numbers just tells you we don't know. And that's an important thing. So one is the modern technology. With Google, I can take planet Earth, this is from Google Earth, and I can take away the planet, just as Nathan Cobb suggested, and leave behind just the nematodes and demonstrate how abundant they are. So if I just click to the next slide, what I've done is cleverly color the marine nematodes blue. <laughs> the nematodes of terrestrial ecosystems, I've sorted into those that are generally um, found in more uh, water-rich habitats, green, and the ones that are found in xeric habitats, such as desert yellow. So I think you can see from this, this map that nematodes are everywhere and are hyperabundant. Um, okay, it's a joke, but really if you do this, everywhere you will find nematodes. Um, in Death Valley, underneath the creosote bushes, there are hundreds and hundreds of nematodes. In Antarctica, in the dry valleys, there are nematodes. So nematodes are everywhere, nematodes are important. I started my career working initially in, in nematology in uh, parasites and I moved on to the, the model nematode, Cynorhabditis elegans. And the parasites I worked on were filarial nematodes of humans. They're about 8 to 10 centimeters long, so they're quite big, macrofauna. Um, C. elegans is also quite big. It's about a millimeter long. And we started working on, on nematodes of soils, and I realized that I couldn't identify these nematodes. 
and ask taxonomists, and they said, oh, it's very difficult, even the best nematode taxonomists. So we quite quickly um, decided, because I was doing nematode uh, phylogeny as well, that we, we would use DNA sequences to identify nematodes. And that got around my problem, which is I'm a bad morphologist, but also got around a problem in the nematode community, which is that there are only a few experts around who could identify all those small nematodes in soil. And so we published in just before Paul's paper, um, uh, a paper suggesting we should use molecular barcodes, DNA barcodes, for identifying soil nematodes. And the rest is history. And uh, it's been amazing to watch DNA barcoding really take off. So when I was pr promoting this idea to the nematologist, there was actually quite um, a lot of encouragement and uh, enthusiasm for it, because we know that 23,000 species is a severe underestimate. And, and I look at the, the Linnaean project, and Paul was talking about the, the huge projects in biology. This is one, of, or in science or in, in human endeavor, this is one of the hugest projects ever. It's cost billions. There's no way it hasn't cost billions. And it, and it has been incredibly successful. This Linnaean project underpins so much of what we know about biology, about what we know about crop production, animal production, what we know about biodiversity, and uh, and security of the planet. It has taken 250 to 300 years, however, to get to the position we're at at the moment. And if we look at the number of described species per phylum, and this is slightly out of date, but um, and the, bl the blue, bluey greenish uh, columns here, number of described species per phylum. Obviously, arthropods rule. Note that it is actually a, a logarithmic scale here. Arthropods rule. Nematodes are way behind. So what we have is, is uh, a huge amount of described diversity. But going from the current state of described diversity to the completed Linnaean project is a Sisyphean task. So it's a task that's going to take forever. Um, this is how Lewis Carroll put it in Alice Through the Looking Glass, the Walsh and the Carpenter standing looking at the beach and lamenting about how much sand there was and how long it will take to, to brush it away. Do you suppose that we can identify all the species? I doubt it, said the carpenter, and shed a bitter tear. So it's a Sisyphean project. It's a project which will take all of us forever to name all the taxa on the planet. Um, I speak about uh, charismatic megabiota. And to most people, that means a giraffe. And to me, it means something that's bigger than about two millimeters. And I think if you work on something that's bigger than two millimeters, you're really lucky because you can see your organism. It's probably got morphology that you can distinguish. But most animal life on the planet is less than two millimeters. Most animal life on the planet is less than two millimeters. So we have a Sisyphean project of completing the Linnaean, a Sisyphean task of completing the Linnaean ta uh, project. Remember, Sisyphus was, was condemned by the gods to rolling this rock up the hill, and just as it got to the top every, every evening, it would roll back down again, and you have to start the next day. And this was punishment for being cheeky. Okay. But of course, all life, and I'm, I'm particularly biased towards nematodes and metazoans in general, um, all life has DNA. We have a com common origin with all other uh, uh, species on the planet, and obviously we can use that DNA to generate a barcode, and it doesn't matter if it's just a nondescript little nematode, beautiful as it is, or a giraffe, we can stick that barcode in the nematode and identify where it fits. And that's, that's what's been amazing about this meeting, just seeing how far this barcode project has, has got and how absolutely successful it is. There are always edge cases. There are always barcodes that don't correspond to species, species that don't correspond to barcodes, mitochondria that intergress between things. Those are edge cases, they're important, the exciting biology, but the project has worked. And so I think that's where we are now. Yeah. So we've changed the, the Sisyphean task of um, really getting a handle on new taxa to something that is rolling a, a boulder along the road. It's going to be still going to be a very long road. Oh, there are a lot of you. <laughs> um, it's still going to be a very long road, but at least, at least there's other people uh, doing it, there's, um, yeah, well, okay. And, and the, the project is, is so powerful because already we can build a tree of life 
from DNA sequences. So this is from the Time Tree of Life by Blair Hedges and Sudhir Kumar. And they used barcode data, CO1 data, in part to build this tree. So the, and, and all the other trees that have been shown. So I think the barcode project is working. It's rolling along. Um, it maybe needs to upscale if we're going to complete it within our lifetimes. But it's much better than the Sisyphean Linnaeus project. So the question is, how do we get to these ones? And this one doesn't work either. <laughs> Try another one. Staying on, okay. How do we get to these ones? Remember, this is a log scale. So th these are orders of magnitude change. And the important thing about this log scale is as we get up these bars, the taxa get smaller and smaller. The ones that haven't been described are all the small ones. They're also, also the ones which nobody has ever looked at. So these things, these are, are uh, myofauna from, from beaches, beautiful SEMs. Um, some of them, you probably guess what they are, ostracods, etc. Others you may never have seen before. And they are all beautiful, but they're all very, very small. They're all crowded with morphology, but if you look at several different taxa, they all look pretty much the same to us. They can tell each other apart, they know who, know who to have sex with, but uh, to us it's very difficult. So, that's where metabarcoding comes in. And I'm really interested in this specimen independent metabarcoding process where we survey an ecosystem to find organisms that we didn't know were there, so organisms we've never seen, and to use that either as a pointer to real taxonomists and real biologists, if you like, to go in and find those organisms, find their morphology and describe them, but also so we can just use the diversity we find with DNA um, just to do directly to do um, biology. So this is Clara's honors project. This is our rainforest ecosystem. I think it's even better than Charles Godfrey's Meadow. This is the physics lecture theater on our campus. It faces south. This is the back wall, the north wall. As you all know, it rains sometimes in Scotland and, and the sun shines sometimes. This doesn't see the sun, but it sees a lot of rain and, and uh, diffuse light from from up above. Um, it is covered with essentially a monocrop of either Marcantia polymorpha liverwort or a mixture of mosses. Obviously, there's in interaction between these two. So the, the ecosystem can be divided into two liverwort versus moss. If you're a very small organism, this is a rainforest. So we're interested in what animals live in this rainforest. Um, so we did that using MySeq. I used to use the 454 for doing metabarcoding. I got really depressed by 454 data. I'm sorry if there's anybody from four, Roche 454 in, in the audience or anybody who still loves 454 data. I really hated it that um, all the PCR and the stutter in the sequencing generated all these variants which were just machine noise and that depending on the algorithm I used to analyze the data, I got a different roster of OTUs. Um, I find that uh, entirely unsatisfactory Actually, what I'm mostly doing is analyzing machine noise. Um, the Illumina sequencers um, solve that for me. Um, we can generate millions and millions of sequences. We can be absolutely rigorous about throwing away low quality data. Um, and we can generate quite long paired end sequences, such we end up with 400, 500 base fragments, and that, that'll get longer and longer. And we can also classify these into OTU with, by whatever method we like. And on this wonderful ecosystem, hyper-diverse ecosystem, we found something like 8,000 OTU that we could name to genus. So this is using 18S rather than cytochrome oxidase 1. So the reason we've been using 18S is because we have more universal primers. If we want to focus on, on ectisozoa or arthropods, and we would use different uh, primer, but we can identify 7,800. Um, for the abundant ones, it's about 200. 200 taxa sitting underneath there. And you can do ecology with these. So first of all, we can ask what's there. Hooray, nematodes win. Um, both in terms of OTU and in terms of numbers of sequences, um, it's nem nematoda wins outright. The most frequent motu is plectus. This is the one we see down the microscope. Um, but importantly, plectus, we found uh, 600,000 sequences in this data set, which were base identical. 600,000 sequences which were base identical after the sequencing. No machine noise. Yeah. 
So I, I, it, it, the, the world has changed, and we can now do it. There are nine animal phyla represented. Those of you with eyes, which are good, will notice we found core data, and all you, you, you may be saying, oh, that's humans. You contaminate who is human. This is actually a, a pigeon. And those of you will notice that there's obviously pigeons sitting up here. So we didn't collect much pigeon, but we collected some pigeon. Um, there are eight other phyla here, including gastrotrix. How many people have ever seen a gastrotrix? Hooray! <laughs> beautiful beasts, beautiful beasts. There are lots of tardigrades, my second favorite organism after um, nematodes. Flatworms, flatworms that we'd miss by doing usual formalin-based morphological surveys, because a small flatworm, these are micro flatworms, when you put formalin on it, scrumples up to just like a little piece of, of rolled up brown paper, and you wouldn't identify it as a flatworm. So we've suddenly got access to the biodiversity in this ecosystem. Well, Clara has, and Clara's not, um, uh, well, was an undergraduate student. We can do ecology, so this is, um, plotting the proportional presence of the OTUs between uh, liverwort samples and moss samples. Here's Plectus, Plectus aquatilis. It's absolutely equally divided between the two sites. That's good. Or the two sample types, this is, this is the mean of three. But we have a number of taxa which are overrepresented in liverwort, a number of animal taxa that are overrepresented in moss. They happen to be tardigrades, which is fun. Um, but we can do ecology with these things. We don't actually need to know what these are. We can immediately say, these are interesting things that are responding to our sampling or treatment. So I think, for me, that we can reduce the cost of this per sample to a very small amount. We can multiplex deeply. We can use the, the new uh, higher throughput air sequencing machines and generate vast amounts of data. So back in that paper in 2002, uh, we co coined this name MOTU, Molecular Operational Taxonomic Units. And I just want to assure you all, it's not just an acronym. It really does mean something. And um, it's actually a word in Polynesian. And many of the Polynesian languages, including Tahiti and Easter Island, retain this word motu as, as, a, as a STEM word, which is used for describing a lot of things. So it has two absolutely key meanings. One is the meaning to cut or to snap off. So I regard that as, as an analogy to our defining operational taxonomic units as things which are distinct from others. So, motuate hao means to cut off, uh, to snap the fishing line off. This is motuate animals or plants, whatever. This is snapping off, defining them as separate things. The other one is to engrave or inscribe. And on Easter Island, there's this uh, uh, rogo rogo, which are un uninterpretable pa wooden panels carved with these amazing designs, which are not translatable, there's no Rosetta Stone for them. But they're called Motu, and they are the names. They are um, engraved or inscribed. So we're not only cutting things off, we're also naming them. And of course, absolutely perfectly, it also means islet. So we're cutting things off to be islets. So there are all these names of little islets around Easter Island, which are called Motu. So I think Motu is, is a lovely word. It comes from Polynesian. It also happens to be an acronym, but um, it does have a background in, in thinking about how, how uh, exactly what we're doing with these MOTUs. So MOTUs approximately equal to bins from the sense of bold systems. They don't equal species, so they're not the same as species, but they often approximate to species or to cryptic species. And especially if we can do multi-locus barcoding from individual specimens, they really will equate to species. But I think that often here means that we can actually use them in the same way um, in ecology and um, ecosystem assessment as, of, as we would other things. The beauty is they're entirely transferable between systems. This is kind of, a, 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 I, I think we should be using MOTU or BINs um, as, our, as our identifiers, and I agree that they're rather boring. Calling something number 164 is very different from calling it uh, Elaphus Elaphus, but so in, in the Linnaean system, barcoding and Linnaean system is essentially a platonic, a platonic relationship, and I mean that in terms of Plato and the definition of, of pure solids, that pure things are defined, 
Barcodes are defined that help identify those, and barcodes are for additional characters which improve the name taxonomy. If we start doing specimen-based community barcoding, and I've used the example of the Astraptes uh, uh, caterpillars here, we can start discovering new taxa and cryptic taxa and improve the Linnaean uh, system, but we still need the Linnaean system taxonomic framework to do that. What we have in this uh, barcoding soup or in this wonderful uh, picture from uh, Victorian London, monster soup, is a way of surveying for new taxa, which are then going to drive uh, discovery efforts. Where do we go to look for the three millionth species that we want to barcode and identify and describe? And also starting to really probe ecosystems. And I think the important thing here is I, I doubt that in my lifetime, the Linnaean project is going to get beyond a few times 10 to the 6 taxa. I think there are 10 to the 8 taxa on the planet. I'm quite happy to have discussions with people about why I'm over-optimistic or stupid. But I think the only way we're going to get to those 10 to the 8 taxa, or even approach that, is by doing uh, specimen-independent community barcoding. And it's all symbiotic. It all feeds into each other. But I think the majority of our ecology work and our survey work is going to be done especially with the tiny organisms, is going to be done with specimen-independent community barcoding. There are going to be species out there which are incredibly important, which we've never seen. If they're really important, we will find them, we will grow them, we will describe them. But just as in microbial barcoding, the, the most abundant bacterium in the sea um, only appeared as a 16S sequence for many years. Now it's cultured, but for many years we knew that the most abundant cellular organism in the sea was something we didn't know uh, what it looked like. Um, I think that's going to be true of, of eukaryotes as well. And so I think we've, with specimen independent barcoding, we can really shift the Sisyphean struggle. And I think we can really be part of an incredible uh, movement towards understanding biodiversity on the planet. And there's a lovely quote from Albert Camus. I'm in Canada, so I have to do some of my lecture in French. Um, so the, the struggle towards the summit itself, so that, that single struggle towards the summit that Sisyphus is involved in, is enough to fill the, the, the heart or the life of a human being. Yeah? And Albert Camus says that we must imagine we're human beings, our life is pointless on the planet, the sun's going to go out, you know, there's no point to life. But we must imagine Sisyphus happy, and that's what we're doing, we're involved, engaged in the Sisyphean task, and it's glorious. It's absolutely glorious. Anyway, uh, thank Clara and Martin again, and you for listening. Any questions from the floor? There's another one here and another one here. Don't just start. Would, would you dare to speculate as to how many unicellular eukaryotes there are? I'd love to. I mean, I think that's part of this 10 to the 8. So, so I, think that, that's, I, think, I think we're going to get to that. The, the um, Tara Oceans Plankton Project, has, which is only looking at the top photic zone of the ocean, it published um, in Science two, three months ago, a bit, bit while ago. They, they produced a surprisingly low number of bacteria. So their estimate for global open ocean surface bacteria is only uh, 40,000 taxa. But the planktonic taxa, their curve is, the planktonic eukaryotes, the unicells, their curve is nowhere near asymptotes. So, so I think a large proportion of that will give you 10 to the 7. I mean, I, you know, is going to be unicellular eukaryotes. Even in, in our little sample at the back of the physics lecture theater in that um, Marcantia um, uh, rainforest, um, about half the taxa we find are uh, uh, allied to, to protozoan phylum. Hi, here. Well, Do you think it's worth saving the uh, homogenate or the whole genome extract or uh, in, for what length of time and why? 
would I save the... Um, we obviously do, and we've done that. We published some time ago on, on a, a beach survey um, in West Scotland where we went back to a beach which John Lambshead had surveyed for his thesis and had looked at something like 20,000 nematode specimens. We surveyed, surveyed the same beach with 454, and we've just redone that same beach with MySeq off the same extraction samples. So that's really valuable for improvements in technology and testing. I and mean, I think for these, for these samples, if you think they are really valuable, Keep them. Um, what do I think? I'm, I'm much more interested in preserving the rainforest at the back of the physics lecture theater in situ um, than the DNA samples. I mean, I, th I think if there was a registry for published metabarcoding analyses where you would also deposit a DNA sample from that uh, extraction, that would be a very valuable thing. So that could go alongside your short read archive and your your um, OTU uh, registry submissions. Uh, you obviously have an interest in that with the, the frozen arc, yes? Do you have an opinion? Yeah, I don't. I, I think most specimens in arcs are um, communities anyway. So I'm not sure why anybody cares if they're mixed. And you start out with having them mixed. Yeah, I think we can be very optimistic about sequencing. Yeah, I think we can be... 18,000 MOTU in your front lawn, going out and finding it again could be tough. Yeah, depends how abundant it is, but yeah. I, I think um, we should stop, probably. <laughs> yeah, I think we, we've got to assume that the sequence technology is going to get better and cheaper and longer, especially. And so the problem of assembling metagenomes, which is a, a major bioinformatic task now, is going to become easier and easier. So with nanopore type sequencers and other things, that we would be able to take soup and re reconstruct organisms from the soup. You can do it with bacteria now, but to doing things with more complex genomes, not the bacteria aren't complex, with larger genomes, it may be difficult. Okay, one, one here. So regarding the issue of unicellular versus pluricellular eukaryotes and the fact that you mentioned 600,000 identical sequences from one taxon, are you correcting for biomass, or do you think we should, or how do you deal with counting individuals of things that have multiple cells versus one cell? Yeah, so I, I see, um, especially with Cytomox Days 1 and slightly with, with 18S, I see that as equivalent to counting ATP. So, so the, the nuclear genome has, um, well, so the cell has so many mi mitochondria, and we're counting the number of mitochondrial genomes. That's a going to be, to me, that's a proxy for ATP, which is a proxy for the metabolic activity of that genome or that taxon's genome in the ecosystem. So I'm less interested in counting individuals and comparing the nematode to the gastrotrich to the protozoan. But if you, if you take these mitochondrial counts as being an approximate um, estimate of biochemical activity or biochemical effort, physiological contribution to the to the ecosystem, then I think they're actually really quite good assessors. Yeah, and, and, and that comes out of biomass. Just cells are different sizes. <laughs> yeah. Someone? Oh. Uh, simple. Hi. Yeah. So why uh, did you get so much uh, nematode in that locality? Because is that because you are a nematologist? <laughs> it would be the same any site. So if our, our beach samples, they're full of nematodes. Our soil samples are full of nematodes. Um, moss samples are full of nematodes. Um, the grass at the front here will be full of nematodes. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank
So our next speaker is Miki Hofreiter from the University of Potsdam in Germany. And we'll be talking about genomic analysis from highly degraded DNA. Well, uh, can you hear me? Uh, okay. okay. Uh, you turn it off, Mark. Um, so it's a great pleasure being here. Um, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me, especially Merdat, because I'm not working on barcoding. Um, Merdat also told me I should go over time that he has to talk less. Um, I try not to do that, but if I do so, I blame him. Um, so what I also don't work on, and I always um, say this in the beginning, is dinosaurs, because DNA doesn't survive in dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are way too old, their remains, um, they went extinct a long time ago, we can't get DNA from. Um, I found the talks I've heard here absolutely fantastic, um, although I'm not working on barcoding, and especially Paul's metaphor um, in his first talk about we are burning the books of life, I think it's a very powerful metaphor, and he's not right that people don't burn books, but um, what we know from history is if people do burn books, it's usually not good times. Well, I'm not working on burnt books of life. Um, if they're really burnt, um, you can't do anything with them anymore. What I work on is kind of degraded books of life, books of life that have degraded over time. And for a long time, that was actually a very tedious way of working. Um, we got very small data sets um, with a lot of work, and the interpretation of these data sets was, all, was very often rather questionable. This has changed completely during the last couple of years. Um, and we're now able to look at complete genomes. Um, and people do that. Um, Svante Pebo recently announced he's going to do 100 um, 30,000 year old human genomes to 30 full coverage. That is something we could not have dreamed of um, a couple of years ago. And even a small lab like mine um, can do a few dozen. Um, well, low coverage genomes um, from various species. Now, I should point out that in a way, what we do are what uh, Mark has called edge cases. So we're not processing hundreds of thousands or even millions of specimens. We're processing few specimens, and we are very much interested in how to get um, the maximum of DNA out of these um, and to look more into the evolutionary history. Um, we do occasionally barcoding like studies, but there are not that many species we can look at with ancient DNA for a start. So I'll mainly talk about technology and what has made it possible that we can look um, at complete genomes from degraded DNA. And there are a couple of things. Um, of course, there's the next generation or massively parallel um, sequencing. Um, but for ancient DNA, there are other things like targeting the right part of the genome, improving extraction methods, which I think is always interesting for people who try, for example, um, wet um, collection samples or formalin preserved samples. Um, same is true for new library building methods and also for DNA hybridization capture. And I'll go basically through all of these, um, more or less in the order they're shown here. And I'll start with DNA sequencing re revolution. I mean, Nowadays, I think most people are familiar with that. Mostly people use that machine, um, the Illumina, and various versions. We have a NextSec, um, a very nice machine, also you can't get too high throughput with it. And what it has made possible is um, a massive increase in sequencing throughput, about um, 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 orders of magnitude um, since we changed from Sanger sequencing to um, first 454 and then Illumina sequencing. And Mark has just shown um, a logarithmic scale as well, and I would think human brains can't work with logarithmic scales, so I'm showing this differently. Um, this dot shows you how much data you could get from a single Sanger sequencing machine. Um, this shows 454 sequencing, and if you take Illumina sequencing, um, it fills the entire wall. Um, and, and I think this is fantastic. Um, I mean, there, there are people who claim that it's too much data, we can't handle it. I think that's nonsense, and it's absolutely fantastic. The more data, as long as it's good data, we can get the better. Unfortunately, um, in ancient DNA, this alone doesn't help us. It helps us a lot, um, but it's not enough, because if we look at ancient DNA samples, this is from a study already 10 years ago, and was actually done with cloning and sequencing clones. You can see that these are two different samples of cave bears, that if we're lucky, about 5% of the sequences we get are cave bear. 
Um, if we're unlucky, it's 1% or less. And the rest is bacteria, fungi, who knows what, um, maybe unicellular eukaryotes that have been growing on the bone. And um, so we can't really use um, this data. So that means, if we take that sample, um, sequencing a cave per genome costs 100 times of sequencing a modern brown bear. And because our sequencing results are shorter, um, the cost relationship is rather 600 times. That's actually very bad. So you can get 600 modern genomes for the price you can get one ancient genome. Um, in a way, this has been known um, for a long time because in 1996, um, somebody used hybridization dot plots um, to show that in that sample, uh, a ground was actually only 0.1% of the DNA went back to that species. So we've known that for a long time, and embarrassingly, we basically didn't do anything about it. Um, also, we could have known there's something we can do about it because it, it really creates a problem of costs un, unless you're really rich, um, which some labs are. Um, and the point is, for a long time we said, um, it doesn't matter which um, bone you take, um, we just took what the curators gave us. Um, but that was, of course, not the best um, approach because there are differences in bones in the skeleton. And one difference between different parts of the skeleton is density. The densest bone um, in the mammalian skeleton is the petrous bone. And it's called that way because it's hard like a stone. And it yields absolutely fantastic amounts of DNA. Though so this shows um, our current result on 23 petrous bones. And um, here you can see the endogenous DNA content. You can see it goes up to almost 80%, um, which is almost as good as modern DNA. Um, and then it goes down. I mean, there are some samples that are really in the low end. These are very often very old. But basically, everything is above 10%. So this is brilliant. Um, and of course, you can't always have petrous bones. But what you can do is you can scan and get the hardest um, part of a skeleton. Or if you have other organisms, you can put some effort in figuring out where you get the best DNA out. Um, in ancient DNA, we didn't do that for a very long time. And if you can't get any good samples from a skeleton, there's something else you can do. It was published in the last issue of Biotechniques by a former PhD student of mine, Matthias Meyer. You take your bone powder, you bleach it, and that removes most of the exogenous DNA. You get kind of variable results, but if you try it a couple of times, you can easily get up um, into the 50% range. Which means, apart from the problem of the sequencing length, um, it's only twice as expensive um, sequencing an ancient genome than sequencing a modern genome. Um, there are other things you can improve. And again, this is kind of embarrassing for the ancient DNA community. Because down here, you can see a method we have used for a long time to extract DNA. And you can see how much DNA we got out here. Up here um, is a method that was published in 2013. And we get something like 40 times more out. Um, so almost two orders of magnitude. And not only that, you can, you can probably not even see it. We can see here that it's between 100 and 300 base pairs what we get here. And here you can see a lot of much shorter fragments with this method. And again, that is something we have known for ages. This is a paper from 1988, um, short but faithful pieces of ancient DNA. Um, so already then, people knew that ancient DNA is short, it's fragmented. Um, not really how fragmented it is. That was done step by step. In 2004, um, we published a paper where we showed the shorter you go, so with 175 base pairs, you don't amplify anything. Then you can amplify two specimens. And the smaller you go, this is pretty short for PCR, um, the more you can get. Um, Hendrik Pointer in 2006, did a quantitative study, quantitative piece quantitative PCR and actually showed that you get an exponential decay of copy numbers with increasing lengths. So you get 350,000 here, you get 1,000 here. And then finally, in 2010, we had the data from next generation sequencing. And it actually showed, um, if we go back here, the shortest fragment here is 84 base pairs. Um, this is actually here. Here's 100 base pairs. That still means that you lose like 95% or more, 99% of your reads. Almost everything is in this very, very low range. Yet, um, the methods we used for extracting DNA were not fitted for very short reads, which is shown here. Um, this is a comparison of the old method um, in light gray to the new extraction method that was published in 2013. And you can see 
Um, here you only get 20% of your reads, um, of your DNA out of your samples. The rest is lost during purification. Um, and this is actually also interesting for museum specimens because we tried um, a combination of methods, including this purification method, and we got something like 160 nanograms per microliter of DNA from museum skins. Um, so that's pretty good. So for us, museum skins um, are things we can do when we're fed up with our really ancient stuff. Um, they are much easier. Um, and we need these methods because if we go to very old ancient DNA, that means 150,000 years, um, what you can see here is that basically everything is below 60 base pairs. So the peak we get here um, is around 30 base pairs. So extremely fragmented DNA. Now that also means um, we have to think how we build our NGS libraries. Um, this actually, I think, is a university library somewhere I grabbed from the net. Um, and there are two ways. The way basically everybody uses is double-stranded adapters or added to your template. Um, that's a classical um, Illumina sequencing library construction. Again, Matthias Meyer developed a different methodology um, based on single-stranded um, DNA. So what you do is you, de um, you denature your DNA simply by heat. So you have single strands, and then you add a single-stranded adapter, bind it um, to a strap that we didn't beat, and then actually extend with a primer, add a double-stranded adapter on the other hand, and then you get your library. And some people have complained about this methodology um, and say, it's not much better than um, double-stranded DNA. Um, we haven't developed that, so that was long after I had left the lab. Um, but I can tell you, we implemented it, and we get conversion ratios of 50 to 60% of the DNA you have in your sample. So you still lose half, but with the double-stranded, you lose 90 to 95%. That's totally fine if you have enough DNA, but if you don't have enough DNA, like we have, um, we prefer that one. Um, and these methodologies together, um, they have made it possible to extend the time scale from what was used, what was believed to be the limit about 100,000 years for ancient DNA to 400,000 years outside the permafrost and 700,000 years inside the permafrost. Outside the permafrost, we might have shifted the limit to about 500,000 years, but we're not too sure yet. So that also tells you why dinosaurs don't work. Um, they went extinct 65 million years ago. So two orders of magnitude deeper in time. It's not going to happen. Um, these methodologies also have an effect on the DNA recovered. Um, and what is shown here are four samples that were extracted with three different methods. And then the red ones are um, extracts that were converted with the double-stranded library um, construction, the blue ones with the um, single-stranded library construction. And what is shown on the x-axis is actually the average read length um, and um, the distribution. And you can see it's massively different. It actually differs more between methodologies with inner sample than between samples across methodologies. And to show you that um, more graphically, um, this is the same extract um, turned into a library either with double-stranded or with single-stranded. And you can see that the read length distributions are massively different. Um, if you then add a different extraction method, um, different purification method, you get pictures like this versus this. Absolutely massively different. And if you then want to reconstruct um, parameters like DNA fragmentation, um, you get completely different trajectories. And if you estimate um, DNA um, half-life from these trajectories, you get completely different half-life times and maximum survival times for ancient DNA. So the methodologies are really crucial um, in ancient DNA, um, and they are still changing. Um, so we hope still to shift a little bit, getting more short fragments and um, more converted. OK, um, so that's the methodology. Back to the endogenous content. Um, even with bleaching, with Petrus, sometimes you can't get over this problem. Sometimes you have samples that don't go over 1% endogenous DNA content. Um, sometimes you also don't want to do shotgun sequencing. And if you have a distribution like that, that creates a problem because if you don't want to shotgun sequence, you somehow have to target your DNA of interest. Now, if your longest read is about 70 base pairs, 
um, you're out of luck for PCR pretty much. You can do PCR that is that short, but given that you have 40 base pairs primers, you have 30 um, base pairs of informative sequencing lengths. Um, even the regular barcodes you use, you need something like 30 PCRs to get the lengths together. Um, that's a bit unhandy, and if you want to do longer sequences, um, it's not what I would recommend. What we use um, is DNA hybridization capture instead. And it works in our hands absolutely beautiful. Um, it's very simple, the idea you have a known sequence, um, you have a synthetic oligonucleotide, you can actually even make um, your baits from modern DNA, and you have your library um, with your adapters, you wash it over, you hybridize it, wash everything away that doesn't fit, and then re the stuff in sequence only um, what um, is complementary. It works absolutely brilliantly, um, and we are applying it in many projects, and I want to talk about one um, that is not really ancient DNA, but it's more related um, to barcoding, um, and that was on river sharks. Um, the river sharks are quite interesting. Um, there are very few specimens in the museum, and they're all of them very old, up to 173 years, and with PCR we didn't get anything, so just no amplification. So we decided um, we try hybridization capture. So why river sharks? Um, they were actually thought to be extinct until um, 1997, um, when they were rediscovered in Borneo and Australia, and we wanted to compare these type specimens, so these were the type specimens for two species, to the newly discovered um, um, specimens. So we did mitochondrial DNA, and um, we did the complete mitochondrial genome, um, because it's not more work to do that with NGS and hybridization capture than doing a short barcode. And we got about um, 10 million reads for each of these specimens, and full coverage of the mitochondrial genome at a couple of, I don't know how many times, a um, couple of thousand times. We then compared these sequences um, with modern samples that had been rediscovered from various locations, Australia, um, Southeast Asia, and here, um, India and Pakistan. And you have to think about a river shark that's an animal that's up to three meters long. Um, so it's, it's, it's not what Mark's working on. Um, it's real megafauna. Uh, <laughs> um, so you, you, you think it should have some morphology attached to it, actually, that allows identifying it. Well, what we found is that it's obviously not that easy, because um, there are five described um, glyphus species, uh, species, Siemensis, Gangeticus, Foliary, Glyphus, and Gariki. And we actually found that three of these are synonymous. They are all here um, very closely related. Um, they're probably one species. But we found another species that is not described at all from, uh, from Borneo and Bangladesh that's out here. And um, this is for the complete mitochondrial genome, 16,000 um, base pairs. We found um, 800 differences, which is approximately 5% difference. So that's pretty sure another species. So even for, for an animal that grows to three meters length, um, you find cryptic species occasionally, which I find quite remarkable. We didn't find 28,000. MOTUs, but um, we found one cryptic species. Um, we, you can also use capture, hybridization capture across wider taxonomic ranges. So you don't need actually to know your species, your target species that well. And um, it works surprisingly well across wide phylogenetic differences if you do it the right way. Um, we started this project on the river sharks is part of a larger project on shark and ray um, phylogenetics. And the problem with sharks and rays is um, there's one properly done genome, and that is the elephant shark or chimera. And from that, we chose 1,400 target genes um, from the nuclear genome. And then we tried how well it works on um, itself, DNA from the same species, and then five skates and rays and seven sharks. And the result was really encouraging because the worst sample we had, we still got a thousand of the 1,400 targets. And we actually found that it works up to 40% sequence difference. So um, even if you have only 60% identity across your sequences, if you um, tweak the conditions a bit, you can get out your sequences of interest. 
So in a way, it works absolutely brilliantly. Um, we have now more than 700 species um, captured with this approach. Um, so a large part of shark and ray um, diversity. And with that many species, it actually shows that there are quite a few more cryptic species, even in these large guys. At the end, two cautionary notes. Um, so far, I've talked all about success stories. Um, but there are limits to these technologies. So um, the inner hybridization capture works up to 40% sequence difference, but there is a limit. And we saw that when we looked at this guy, Homo cerium, um, to be precise, Homo cerium is latidens. Um, so Homo cerium is kind of, is related to the Smilodon. It's a Sabatus cat. Um, it was fairly large, um, though this shows a modern line. This shows Homo cerium, so um, it was probably not too pleasant to come across it. Um, and it actually died out some 12,000 years ago in, the, um, in North America. And when it died out in Europe is a different question because people believed it died out some 200,000 years ago. Um, but there was a finding in the North Sea in 2000 that was dated with actually six different carbon dates to um, 28,000. So um, when humans, modern humans, entered um, Europe, these guys were still around, might have made interesting encounters. So what we were interested in actually is where the heck do these guys come from? Um, because the last fossil is 200,000 years old and then we only have some in North America. So we tried to get um, sequence data from these and there are no close relatives of Homo cerium. So we initially designed baits that were based on modern cats, but then we were very fortunate that another group um, accidentally shotgun sequenced a Homo serum. They thought it's an American lion, um, the bone, and um, found, hey, they suddenly had a partial Homo serum genome. They also had a pas partial Homo serum um, mitochondrial genome. So we designed capture baits based both on modern cats and the Homo serum partial sequence we had. And that shows you the distribution. Again, you can see very many short reads. A few a bit longer ones, but capture actually prefers somewhat longer reads. Um, so you bias your distribution a bit to longer reads. And this is the tree. Um, and here you can see we have three Homo serium, two North American one, one we captured, one um, that was shotgun sequenced, and our North C1. And they nicely fall where they should fall, um, basal to all other phthalates. However, this tree is based on only, only 11,000 base pairs. Um, not the 16,000 base pairs of the mitochondrial genome, because what we found is we had parts of our capture baits that were based on the homoceum shotgun sequence, and part of our capture baits were based on a reconstructed ancestral sequence um, of modern cats, because that's closer to homoceum in the tree than any modern sequence. And these areas were very poorly um, covered, and sometimes we had gaps. Um, and we have new data now, um, and my students didn't allow me to show them because the results are too preliminary, that actually show that if the sequence divergence becomes too large, the capture breaks down and you get these kind of troughs in your sequence coverage. So you have nice coverage, then you have a trough, and then it goes on. So it's not smooth, um, it suddenly breaks down. What we saw on a different project is that actually the more sequence divergence you have between 0 and 25%, the less coverage you get. But it looks kind of smooth, but at some point out here, it suddenly breaks off. So if you, have, if you work with species that are too divergent, hybridization capture doesn't work anymore. The other thing um, is um, identification of species, where um, I want to throw out a cautionary note. And this data come from this species, Elephas antiquus. It's an extinct elephant from Eurasia um, that went extinct, people are not too sure, either 120,000 years ago or 30,000 years ago, probably 120,000 years ago. And we have lots of samples from this species. Um, so complete skeletons, beautifully preserved. So, and Paleontologists are absolutely sure this is an elephant species, um, an Asian elephant, not an African elephant. We got from two different sites complete mitochondrial genomes. 
and we got a tree that looked like this. You have here the mammoths, you have the Asian elephant, you have the African forest elephant, the African savanna elephant, and you have Elephas antiquus in here as a sister group to the African forest elephant. Um, then we talked to paleontologists and they outrageously rejected this possibility. Well, they actually said um, they must have hybridized because elephants occasionally do that. Um, as Mark mentioned, these are the edge cases. You have mitochondrial transfer. Um, so we decided, okay, let's go for the complete genome. And um, so we got genomic data, it's not a complete genome yet, but um, when we use partial genomic data, the tree looks very much the same. So, um, you can, cannot only find um, cryptic species um, with very large animals, you can also find completely incorrect um, genus assignments, and sometimes people won't believe you if you just present them with mitochondrial data. Um, so I am a very strong proponent of multi-locus data. I think it's very useful to have barcoding not only based on mitochondrial data, as great as it is, but sometimes I prefer multi-locus data. Okay, here I should thank um, the people who have done the real work, uh, my research groups, and I was very pleased to see, um, I have this picture for, uh, used for quite some time, that at the entrance of the university here, um, we have kind of a similar animal lying around, and sorry Murdered, you have to give your talk. I'm at the end. A uh, really great presentation. Given the fact that nanopore sequencing is really focusing on long reads, what are your thoughts for nanopore sequencing for ancient DNA? Um, well, personally, but that's a totally personal opinion. Um, at the moment, I don't think it's of any use um, because what we need is many reads, maximum read lengths, 150 base pairs. So long reads don't help us very much. But it's great for assembling modern genomes. Yeah, of course, with the long reads, but the machine will sequence any length of fragment given to it. Hence, 150 base pairs can easily be sequenced on the machine, too. Yeah, if they can get the, uh, the throughput that we get billions of sequences, then it's fine. Yeah. The bait capture results that you presented are really uh, potentially of huge importance to this community in terms of liberating sequence information from many organisms that have seen uh, their DNA handled in tough ways. Have you done any work on formalin preserved material? Um, Do you see any special problems doing bait capture with uh, it? Um, because we are at the moment, um, we have started to work on a modification of the um, library construction that would bypass blocking lesions. Because if you have many blocking lesions, um, also with the single-stranded method, you don't get a library you can capture. And so we first want to see if we can bypass blocking lesions, if we can get better libraries, and then we'll try it. Um, it's something we have just started, but it's something I'm interested in, yeah. One more could you comment on uh, ancient protein sequences? <laughs> well, I can comment. Um, they're useful, um, mostly in cases where we can't get DNA from. Um, for a simple reason, most protein sequences in a bone, and that's most samples we have, um, is collagen. And collagen is of limited informativeness um, when it comes to phylogenies. Um, it's great if you have a group um, that's far away, so you can do a phylogeny with it. But for example, for the elephants, it would be absolutely useless because um, Loxodonta mammoths and Asian elephants all have the same um, collagen sequence. So it has its uses, um, but if I can get DNA from a sample, I prefer DNA. So 
So our last speaker of the morning will be Murdat. Um, this is a bit of a challenge, so I'm not going to do the surname because he doesn't want to show me, tell me what the surname. So it's env environmental DNA barcoding from the Arctic to the tropics. Believe me, I'm not a different species, so uh, I'm, I'm sure you have pronounced more difficult ones. So. Uh, uh, okay, so, um, well, uh, um, welcome again to Guelph, and, uh, you know, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, let me just start by um, kind of a couple of confessions. And uh, But before that, hi, Daniel, that's my three-year-old uh, son uh, watching this on YouTube, and... Uh, I should thank them, and they're like five minutes away from here, and my daughter is uh, in a summer camp just next building, and so, uh, so yeah, I mean, they have been really supportive and, and helpful, especially recently as we uh, kind of uh, navigated through organizing this, uh, this meeting. But the confessions, I mean, the first one is uh, kind of occurred to me about a month ago, which is, uh, you know, by organizing the meeting in Guelph, and having all, uh, all bio and, and my students and, and, and others participating, uh, I realized that I have nothing to say because they're going to be presenting all the work. So, so that's the sort of first challenge I faced, and I'm going to try to sort of deal with that. Uh, the second one uh, is, uh, you know, like inviting the, the previous two speakers. You know, that's another confession. I wish I had not done that. So, uh, again, you know, the, 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 the work that they have done, and, and, you know, like they kind of both been... Uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, mentor and, you know, like uh, for, for my work and, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, I've learned quite a lot from them. So bear with me uh, as I start to sort of, uh, you know, like uh, discuss some of the work that we have done. Now, I, I try to kind of find kind of beautiful maps and things, and this is uh, uh, what I kind of stole from a, a talk that Donald Bird, my uh, co-conspirator and, and colleague in, in Environment Canada, Show then it's a, and the title is from a World Bank uh, visualization is about remoteness and connectedness and so I think uh, you know uh, for me as I kind of start working on on more remote sites you know where where, where there is biodiversity or what we, what we think there is biodiversity left and and we saw from Ted Yahara's talk for example you know the Asian uh, perspective of of, of the forests uh, like. Uh, I mean, these are sort of basically a good map for us to sort of think about like how we're going to build up capacity to, uh, to move towards what uh, uh, Paul envisioned and, and, and Mark uh, uh, Blackster just uh, kind of uh, put in the, in the stage of a framework of, you know, what we can do. So, and, and what I think that, you know, like we need to think about is that how the DNA barcodes and, and the information that we get, which reflects to biodiversity, can be linked to all of these socioeconomic and, and, and societal and scientific um, endeavors that are, are kind of linked to where biodiversity resides. And in our nation, uh, this, is, this is a huge uh, issue. And, and, and again, you know, like, um, it's not very difficult to find out, um, you know, like uh, places that are quite remote and, and, and not populated but they have been exceedingly, you know, under the, you know, inf impact of, you know, like uh, uh, resource development. And, and again, this is a catch-22 because our economy is based on that. So we can't just move away from some of these, uh, um, you know, like uh, without thinking about like the consequences. Um, and, and as I move and, and look at the media very recently, this is from, you know, like not long ago, uh, you know, uh, what is happening, you know, like in, in very remote areas where, I think there are kind of frontiers for discovering biodiversity and so the impact of those things. In, in these cases, I kind of try to categorize the type of challenges or the type of things that we need to do. And, and I, I, I will be short and, and quick because other speakers touched on those uh, uh, concepts. Like um, in many cases, we need to track the species that we know are at risk. And you know, in, uh, this is an example of marine mammals and uh, you know, like they're charismatic, they're you know, like, uh, you know, like also been, uh, you know, like uh, studied intensively and uh, they're linked to the ecosystem health. And that's why, you know, like, and, and, and unfortunately their populations are, you know, decreasing and uh, in many cases. Um, so in this case, we do need tools and, 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 and to go in and, and identify and track them. Sometimes, you know, a species level is sufficient, but we may need to get the population and individual level. Like I've learned, for example, the, you know, Eastern gray whale, you know, that's 
so rare that you know we really need to kind of track the individuals of the of the of the tribes and another layer of dealing with this is to to map their habitats you know like and and, and that's another sort of uh, layer of information that's going to give us the dimension of the biodiversity data that we need you know the the food that they they consume or the whole ecosystem that enables uh, these organisms to, uh, to to live in an environment uh, another, uh, I would say, angle that gets into kind of more ecological work, um, and, and I give a practical, again, application or practical sort of real world scenario, is the natural resource management. And I've been working with, with the scientists uh, and, and managers of uh, our own agency here, and, and they are sort of developing, and they have been developing programs, and they, they do need more information, biodiversity information, to measure ecosystem services and, and in this case you know like the health of the forests as is reflected in the health of the soil and the health of the rivers and and the streams that pass through them uh, need to be considered uh, and another sort of similar but you know like with a kind of a different sort of uh, scale is is to track the cumulative effects in ecosystems and i give you an example um, sort of north of where we are in kind a of far north in northern ontario we have this system called ring of fire and, and as you probably know, Northern Ontario is quite famous for mining activities. And, and, and the Ring of Fire is just becoming feasible and, and the licenses have been issued for mining. And the government uh, is thinking, you know, like how can we kind of plan by, by developing tools based on DNA and other technologies to track the cumulative effects that may come um, as a consequence of the development of these. Uh, Melania did a great job talking about invasive species, and 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 again, you know, uh, uh, like Paul is in the audience, so I, I mean, and and he has done a lot of work on this and others. Uh, but the example of you know, like these are the list of you know, like species in our own neighborhood, you know, in 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 the Great Lakes that have been invaders, and and they've done the damage, they're doing the damage, and then there are some cases that, you know, like we are barely kind of holding, you know, with, with, uh, with the killer shrimp or Asian carp, and you've seen in the news. So how can we basically utilize these technologies, so uh, DNA-based technologies to deal with them, and, and you've heard. Now, I'm not going to go into more details, uh, just going to show you uh, a photo of Paul. No, that's not Paul, that's, that's, uh, that's Fred Sanger, and, uh, and, and that's how it has started and in terms of you know like DNA barcoding and 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 um, I'm saddened the, by the fact that the, you know Sanger you know died and uh, but but when you look at the legacy that been kind of generated you know the knowledge you know all of these things is based on the technology and and uh, uh, and the approach that was developed by by Sanger and then now we can see uh, many uh, other methods that are being developed uh, but I mean uh, I, I made this cartoon in 2007 thinking about how biosystematics uh, from population to phylogenies can, can utilize DNA-based uh, information. And, and the reason I did this over Christmas with, with Donald Hickey and Paul and, and Greg Singer um, was to try to position DNA barcoding within the context of biosystematics uh, in terms of sampling, uh, in terms of sequencing, and in terms of the type of information we get um, and, and that was mainly, uh, you know, a way to try to articulate the mission of Barcode of Life and, you know, capturing all the DNA extracts and then using them for doing deep phylogenies and, and, uh, and adding more genes here or adding, you know, cases that we are kind of finding interesting patterns. And uh, I've done this with Dan Jansen, you know, uh, uh, for a number of cases, and it warned me not to get too distracted. Um, in terms of understanding, you know, the local, uh, you know, like uh, adaptation, cryptic species, population level variation. So I actually think that in 2015, with the new technologies and how barcoding has evolved, um, at least I'm going to revisit the, uh, uh, the way these arrows are pointed or, or their kind of, uh, you know, size and, and how they're going to work. And, and, and perhaps, you know, like we can see that this becomes more like, you know, one unified system where we can look at you know a barcode as an entry point and then you know like quickly you know generate a lot of more data and and I know Eric Kuzak is going to talk about some of this uh, uh, you know like uh, tools uh, based on shotgun sequencing and so on now but fundamentally I think we also need to ask this question as we go forward Mickey uh, put this uh, in the context of ancient DNA 
is really we are at the stage that we can engineer uh, genomics tools and, uh, and, and information systems to address questions. It used to be that, you know, we have Sanger reads that are this much, and we have primers that are, you know, like good for this group and that group. I think that, you know, and, 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 and again, you know, several years ago, uh, we looked at this from a barcode size when we were struggling to deal with museum samples and we were thinking about adopting and using next-gen sequencing technologies is that we did this sliding window uh, analysis where we basically, you know, chopped the barcode sequence uh, systematically and then looked at the proportion of the species uh, that are detected and we kind of converged around 300 base. So essentially, the current barcode um, uh, length to me is an even overkill, but it, it's required because when you think about the sequencing technologies and the error rate, I think that we do need to keep the barcode standard as it is, at least for animals, uh, because again, we need to have some more confidence in the data that we are building. And as it's been shown, the primers are working well, you know, at least for, 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 for many groups that we have looked at. So, so moving quickly towards whole genome approaches, I think that needs to be taken, uh, you know, with a bit of caution when you think about the mission and when you think about the, the, the level that we are looking. How do we obtain sequences? So, uh, like, basically, as, as you all know, uh, or, uh, or gold standard preferred and, and, and an enabler technology, in this case, been uh, Sanger sequencing and, and, and the approach that's been used in collection-based uh, research, sorting organisms, um, identifying them as, as, as much as possible, with, with as, as fast as possible, and, um, and then moving towards, uh, you know, sequencing. And, and you can build a very uh, high-confident sequence library using this. And, uh, you know, I grew up with this technology from my graduate uh, work, and, and I still send some of my sequences to Sanger Sequencing. Uh, but I think that we also have and, uh, been cautious, have been careful to kind of think about the possibilities with next-gen sequencing, and, and I, we have seen many examples. Um, and Shadi Shakrola uh, in my lab developed uh, this fantastic approach of, uh, uh, you know, working uh, with the sorted material with, with next-gen sequencing. The workflow still got some limitation in terms of, you know, bioinformatics and, 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 and also streamlining and provisioning specimens, but, but, they, uh, but it's coming. And I think that it's, it's, it's quite time now to think about this a bit more seriously. And, and, and people who have uh, the possibility to do comparisons, build informatics tools, um, just as, you know, like we were developing the barcoding and it took uh, about 20 years of Sanger sequencing to the point that we started utilizing it for barcoding in a serious way. I think that we are like seven, eight years in the, in the, in the next gen sequencing uh, age, and I think that we are seeing, uh, you know, some of these type of technology. The good thing here is that you get a lot of coverage, so you can, and it's clonal and it's parallel sequencing, so you can see if there is a Wolbachia or where there is a pseudogene and those things. But, but again, it's not been matured. There have been a couple of papers, at least on the barcoding side, I know that people have been using this in genotyping and medical side uh, for quite a while. But I think by and large, as you have heard, we are uh, using next gen sequencing for bulk specimens, and, 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 and I'm not going to go through that. Most of my talk is going to focus on what we have been able to do and what is maybe possible and what I don't think is possible at this point. So, so this kind of idea of doing uh, you know, uh, sequencing from bulk or eDNA um, kind of have been named uh, with various terms. Some of them, I think that, you know, like are more imaginative in terms of opening the barcoding, the meta barcoding, so moving away from just the standard barcode. And, and some of them have been kind of rooted to genetics uh, work and so on. Um, I kind of use this term because I want to have everything here. And, uh, and, and again, you know, like I think that the information we get allows us to go from in various levels of organizations. Here, this bubble chart is an old one but it's still quite valid in my opinion, given that we have the libraries uh, of these genes and we have taxonomic resolution, uh, you know, for various groups of organisms. And as you can see, most of these are actual barcodes. 16S is kind of the de facto barcode for uh, 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 what we call bacterial species, even though bacteria don't kind of fit into the species so much. And then 18S is a pre-barcode for uh, protists and uh, been used also exceedingly Mark, I think most of this is from the nematodes because this is a soil data. And, um, and then, you know, 
uh, CO1, ITS, and RBCL are all designated DNA barcodes. And I throw in the 28S because it's also been used quite a lot for fungi and other organisms. So I think with this handful of genes, perhaps, we can, I think that we can solve this biosystematics sort of puzzle from, from the community-based data. Uh, and I think, you know, on an individual basis, we can add more nuclear genes and, and so on. And I think that we have started sort of, uh, you know, like doing some proof of principle around the environmental applications. And uh, this was a paper that came out uh, quite a while ago on bentos with, with, with Donald Bird and the team of Environment Canada. And Donald wrote this perspective article, how this information can move into a real world biomonitoring uh, approach, this notion of biomonitoring 2.0. I helped uh, um, with, uh, Pierre Tabernet, Eric Kuzak, and, um, and, and Lauren Riesberg to kind of uh, uh, edit this issue of molecular ecology that it's kind of aging now uh, from 2012. However, it has a kind of um, a group of um, uh, various studies and perspectives and, and technical reviews on, on the use of these approaches, um, you know, in, in various uh, shapes or forms. And, Technically, we, we thought about another layer, which is, you know, we've, we've heard about malaise traps and, you know, like the, I live in a space that there is a lot of malaise traps around me, you know, like in bio and everywhere and all the backyards around us. So I, I need to think about it, you know, how are we going to use it? I mean, as, as, as me, who is not so much, uh, you know, into organismal biology, I thought, okay, can we get all of them uh, in one shot, but also microbes that uh, are, are there? But that's kind of opened up a new interface to biodiversity data. As, as Naomi mentioned in her talk, uh, you know, we are, we are capturing the arthropod data, but we are also capturing their, uh, their bacteria and, and, and fungi, but it's not linked to individuals. How can we utilize this information? How can we, you know, like put these in a perspective of biodiversity assessment and environmental change scenarios? But doing this, we also, just like Mickey, you know, we, we like to kind of play a little bit in the, uh, in the, in the technology space, and this was uh, an attempt to sort of look at the number of primer sets that are, are used, uh, are needed to kind of get to the point that you can say, you know, I've got everything that I can. And in this case, uh, we looked at combinations of the primer sets for just the CO1, uh, you know, part of the CO1 barcode uh, region, about 350 base pair. And as you can see, there is value in adding more primer sets but it's kind of, you know, getting to the point that it plateaus. And, uh, and right now, we are routinely using two or three primer sets for our mini barcodes of CO1. Uh, and, 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 and I mean, in, in some cases, they sit on the same part of the uh, gene. In some cases, we do the front uh, with two, and then we do the back end with, with another two. Uh, but, but we haven't stepped out of the barcode uh, marker uh, for animals, because we do want to take it of the library that is growing. And, and, and I, 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 I encourage uh, all of the people who feel that primer is an issue for at least some of the animals that we know that primers work in individual uh, specimens, uh, reach out to the community. And, and this was what Karen James mentioned in, in next year's uh, workshop we had. And I saw the tweet by David Chindel saying that, why are the metabarcoding people are using non-standard uh, non, uh, you know, markers you know, as we are building these libraries? This is an idea of, you know, like we shouldn't, as ecologists or molecular ecologists, separate uh, ourselves from uh, taxonomists. You know, like that, that separation can be dangerous for, for the field. Uh, for many years, as I've learned from Dan, uh, ecologists have relied on taxonomists. And, and taxonomists are using DNA barcodes in a standard fashion, and they're building these libraries. They're finding fantastic patterns. And, and, and describing diversity. And as ecologists, we are moving away from using that by just because technically we feel it's impossible to sort of use a, a standard marker. So I don't want to sound like a priest here. So I'm just going to move on. So um, the, uh, the other sort of uh, thing that we have learned is as we combine, uh, you know, like get this uh, um, data from metabarcodes or, you know, uh, environmental barcodes and combine them, we, we get a lot more information uh, from a system, and this is a malaise trap again. This is a published work, and so I'm not gonna get too much into it, but, but we always see this value of adding, and some of this might be uh, um, really uh, false positives, uh, sequence error, but some of it, it's like layers of diversity that we can capture in individual sequences. Uh, now, 
I started thinking, you know, as I, I went and gave a talk in McGill and, and Graham Bell asked me, oh, have you started thinking systematically asking ecological questions? And I have a group of, uh, you know, friends here in, in our department that are uh, familiar with, with ecological questions. And we have started thinking about what we can do with this data in an ecological environmental context and, and also thinking always about the applications and, and, and how it can be used by agencies. That's been my focus. Now, but, but again, you know, I went to Dan uh, to begin with, and I said, you know, can we, the, you know, the Malay strap we did, uh, you know, with, uh, with Joel Gibson, can we get a, a bit more? I sent nine Malay straps uh, with a student, and, and Lisa Ledger is going to talk about this work uh, in the conference. But, but we started thinking about a system that was there and, and, and very familiar uh, uh, by Dan in terms of looking at this area is really sitting in the dry forest side and there is not much any variation other than the fact that one is a primary forest patch, the other one is a 70 year old succession and then there is this fire break that they have kept there. Uh, you know, and so we asked very simple questions, you know, can we measure better diversity uh, using this approach? And in this case, we got the sequences and we used the, the actual library to identify the sequences at the genus level. And it holds. Even though there is quite a bit of variation, we can see that, you know, the differences are, 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 are clear here in a statistical sense. And Lisa did a, a whole thesis on this and, and, and it's coming along and, and she's going to talk about it. it. It holds well with OTUs and, and in, even better. But, but, but even if you go with the identified organisms, you can see. And, and what are these organisms? Obviously, we are focused on arthropods and you can see that uh, in these sites, you can see the distribution of these different uh, groups of uh, arthropods, and, and some of them were a little bit sort of unusual for us, but uh, I think that's kind of, we can imagine how they can get in there. So, and now I think that this can, this type of work can help, hopefully, uh, what's happening down in the middle of this remote, to be, you know, like, not literally, but forest in, in Costa Rica, which is this geothermal, uh, you know, activity. The country relies on these type of, uh, you know, tools to foster their economy, but it's in the middle of this protected area. And can we use these tools to, uh, to deal with the, uh, you know, like assessing the environment? And the good news is that, uh, you know, like these are being actually uh, proactively pursued by some of these industries, if, if it's pitched correctly uh, by someone like Dan, obviously. So, uh, and then that's what's happening right now. So, in, our, in, in, in here in Canada, and going up north a little bit, the, and not, not necessarily the Arctic, but the boreal forest, and we uh, uh, started this project with the help of our agencies, Environment Canada and Parks Canada, and then uh, basically uh, this is uh, um, where the area is, is the Peace Athabasca Delta, and the Alberta oil sands are near, and also hydroelectric activities. And it's, it's, it's a very valuable ecosystem, you know, and, 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 and it's been um, named as an ecosystem under sort of at risk and under threat, and, and it's obvious why. And I think we started sampling intensively to do the meta barcoding, environmental barcoding, with the help of our agencies. And I'm just going to glance at some of the latest kind of findings that we've had with this. We're still crunching the data. And uh, here, for example, I'm going to show you how we sampled uh, most of our sites with, with repeats, and in some cases with soil, we had a lot more repeats. And then the data that is coming out holding quite nicely, this is the OTU level uh, of benthic biodiversity. All the uh, triplicates of the sites stick together in just the uh, you know, unsupervised clustering algorithm, and that's, that's encouraging, but we needed more than that. We needed to compare this with morphology because that's the standard for uh, biomonitoring with aquatic systems. And this is the work that Joel Gibson and others have uh, you know, done and kind of idea of comparing biomonitoring 1 and biomonitoring 2.0. And so uh, here I'm going to show you a little bit of data. Joel is going to talk about it uh, a lot more tomorrow. In this case, we are looking at these two uh, parts of the Peace Athabasca Delta, these two rivers. And, and as you can see here, very nicely, we can separate the gamma diversity at different levels with the morphology, we have the data here, the DNA at the order level, family level, genera and species, and uh, you know, and, and it holds well also, you can, you can do the OTUs and separate the OTUs as I showed you earlier in the, in the graph. Now I'm gonna pause a little bit and ask this question, you know, like, um, why do we need the eDNA in some cases, you know, and I think it's that's part that, you know, like I kind of want to go back and sort of uh, 
think about some of the stuff that I'm doing. We've heard that, you know, like, okay, in this case, there is this animal in the water. Do we need to get the water and get the DNA of the moose? We can see the moose. So in many cases, we have tried to kind of get into the sort of uh, extreme. And, and in the case of bentos, I think that when we have kick nets, you know, and other methods to get these bugs out uh, locally, you know, going after the water, might not be. So I asked this question, you know, we have the data from uh, Wood Buffalo. We sampled water and bentos in the same site. And so we said, let's ask the question, can we separate these, uh, you know, oops, uh, in here, we have water and the bentos in the same site. So I'm just going to show the data for one site. So a comparison of the eDNA in water and, and bentos. So if, if we wanted to see that, you know, like water can replace the bento, so we bypass getting the sample from bentos, then obviously we want to see a, a pattern of, you know, like water, bentos, water, bentos, water, bentos in ABC. However, that wasn't the case. So here what you see is that the benthic samples kind of cluster with each other and, and the water samples cluster with each other. So, so that shows that, you know, like at least in this uh, method that we have used, um, you know, like there is not the same kind of biodiversity reflected from benthic to the water. This is a small system, and this is very preliminary, but when you look at the data, by and large, again, you, you see a drop of about 50%, uh, you know, qualitatively, and there are things in the water that are not in the bentos. So I think that's the sort of thing that we need to be cautious about. I have about seven minutes left, so I'm just going to go a bit faster. Um, we have a lot of good uh, tools to look at vegetation and the surface, you know, using satellite imagery, radars, and so on. But when it gets to the below ground, we really don't have much uh, ability. And, and so we thought in, in Wood Buffalo, again, you know, these are highly dynamic systems. Nicole Fauner told you this story, so I'm not going to go, uh, you know, in detail. I'm just going to show some complementary data that we got from the soil data for, um, for plant diversity. And, and here, again, you know, going into tweaking the uh, sort of marker space and, you know, like uh, what can be done with multiple markers, we can clearly see that if we combine these plant markers and three of them are a standard or, you know, two are a standard and then one is kind of additional uh, here. Uh, and then we added one that is also being used, uh, you know, a lot for, for diet and for, for soil analysis. Uh, we see this idea of the, you know, like complementarity and as Nicole mentioned, you know, like we need to think, uh, you know, like about the libraries uh, carefully when we, we deploy these markers. This is, a, this is what I like more because it puts in the phylogenetic perspective. So we got a, the tree of life of these groups and then fitted the data that we got into it. And as you can see, some groups are just illuminated, uh, lower plants and so on. Uh, you know, like with, 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 with some markers. So I think this idea of multi-marker, as, as, as Mickey mentioned, in some cases is, uh, is very important. And the length of the marker, as, as again, you know, was mentioned, in, uh, for contemporary data, we need to think about longer markers because then we're going to have ubiquitous, you know, like data from, from the soil at least. And this is, again, reflected in, uh, in the work that Nicole Fauner has done in my lab. And then the DNA marker complementarity is going to have another dimension when we are looking at, you know, like association of different organisms. In this case, we are looking at plants and fungi in soil. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of certain, and it's already been shown in a, a number of publications, this type of associations using the DNA barcode data, um, especially in the meta barcoding framework, is going to be very powerful uh, it, to, un to give us understanding of systems that we had absolutely no ability to look at. You know, these are below ground, uh, you know, um, uh, sequences and again you know as you can see you know like we can we can tease apart fungi with these two markers that are kind of geared towards it and and there is going to be a talk again on this uh, uh, by by Terry Porter and she's on mat leave so she's going to come tomorrow just to give her talk and uh, I'm not going to go into it now in terms of the analysis I think this is what we have seen uh, you know uh, throughout the meeting and uh, especially for meta barcoding and, and I think that this is something that down the road we need to think more about it. The norm is we get the sequence data, we do our taxonomic assignments, and then we go and do ecological analysis. That's been pretty much the norm. But, but the meta barcoding is shifting this, this paradigm. And I think in this case, you get the sequence data, you have your OTUs or bins or, or haplotypes or whatever you want to call them, and then put it in the matrix, like use 
a program like vegan or something and get your basic ecological analysis done and then tag your sequences with what they are. Uh, this way, uh, what we have done and, and uh, what we have seen in our data is that if you go with this route, as Mark also showed, you lose about 70-80% of your data uh, depending on where you work. And so the power of the ecological analysis will be reduced quite a lot, especially if you're looking at short changes in the community structure and so on. Um, but, but we don't want to, you know, like give up all of the information that is out there. So once you're done, then you can tag your sequences using the best approaches available in the library so that you can get more biological uh, and, and in fact, you know, test some of the hypothesis. So I think this is going to be become like that. So you go back and forth here. Uh, in terms of additional information. Another, I would say, um, consideration that I want to add here uh, ra rather quickly is, uh, is in terms of sampling, both in terms of sequences and in terms of uh, uh, actual environmental samples. Um, the sequences are getting very cheap. Uh, the read links are good. And, and I think that it's time now to go into kind of hyper, uh, sort of high frequency sampling of the environment uh, not just for microbes, it's been done, but I'm thinking more about like larger organisms. Like in, in terms of, you know, like uh, this may allow us to actually move uh, uh, with the repeated sampling um, into uh, identifying the rare targets uh, more robustly, but possibly developing uh, tools uh, and protocols for quantitative analysis in terms of transforming the presence or absence data into the quantitative analysis. This is what epidemiologists have been doing for decades, I think, and, and ecologists have also worked on it with occupancy models and so on. It just needs to be you know, uh, demonstrated, and I think we need data for it. That's uh, uh, data temporally and especially. And so I think you know, uh, these are the case studies that you know, like we have done, and I'm not going to talk about it. That's my confession here, basically, that I can't get into them. But there are a number of these talks that you know, like throughout the conference, uh, you know, and one poster uh, that are going to talk about various ways that we have played with this. There are collaborators from Portugal, France, and, and, and other places that, you know, like they have done quite a lot of work. I'm excited with what is happening in Norway, Netherlands, and, 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 and so on, Germany. And I think, you know, what we thought, you know, a number, as, as I got started working on wetlands, I need to, again, you know, learn about wetlands and learn about them. And Braulio mentioned, you know, how important wetlands are. So we thought about, like, putting in the context of the wetlands. Wetlands are interesting um, because of their value, but also interesting because of the habitats they harbor and because of the, you know, like also the limited number of them, uh, unfortunately, perhaps. But we are starting to think about, like, you know, like joining forces with Ramsar, uh, the UN Convention on Wetlands, and trying to sort of um, pitch, uh, you know, like this type of approaches to build, you know, like a um, a next generation wetland biodiversity and functional assessment, you know, like uh, uh, system and, and deploy that. And, and in this case, you know, like we can, uh, I'm, I'm going to glance at it and then uh, quickly finish. We can assess biodiversity. Uh, we can also get into functional analysis with some of the transcriptomics work. You can look at the functional genes in two ways, adaptations, you know, and, 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 and what's happening in terms of rates of evolution of these genes. But there's another layer, which is very short term, changes at the individual level. This is the work that mainly ecotoxicologists have been doing. And, uh, and I know that Paul warned me, you know, like not getting into that because it's going to get complicated. But, but I, I actually feel that we can define functional barcodes for some of these, uh, you know, like systems and, and deal with the issues that they are facing, just like the way barcoding has started helping uh, biologists, you know, um, in, in, in the taxonomic context. Uh, right now, we have very, uh, very rare cases of comparisons between methods and species when it comes to these changes in the environment. Few methods are available to look at subletal. We have to wait for organisms to die uh, practically in the lab. And, and, then, uh, and then limitations in terms of ecological effects because the work is doing, done in the lab mainly. And then, uh, and then we can't build a causality, you know, like with, with what's happening in terms of the phenotypic changes. So this is the system. To me, this is a very much barcoding system, really. This is the, you know, like the space that we have with all the community level, 
and then the stressor and where they, they react. And I think that the tra transcriptome level will give us this data. And if it's metatranscriptome or, or targeted metatranscriptome or functional barcodes, it can give us quite a lot of data. In Kunming, I introduced this uh, idea. I'm going to just very quickly in one minute show you some data. The data comes from the Great Lake sediments especially the PCBs that have been very nasty chemicals deployed in these sediments. Uh, and, and, and then we started using a bioinformatics pipeline to, to identify targets. You can do a transcriptome, full transcriptome scan to identify your targets. But we went with a shortcut, and this is the work of Nicole Fauner, uh, sorry, uh, Gina, Gina Capretta and uh, in my lab. And, um, and then basically identifying these targets using this algorithm, moving them into the uh, organisms that are now used because we want to have some comparisons. In this case, we are using hexagenia um, and, and then exposing the hexagenia in the lab with controls. Uh, interestingly, we started about 200 targets. Uh, once we de developed our probes and you know, the generic primers and so on and got our MySeq data and then did the experiments with the exposure, we see uh, these are the three uh, genes that are quite relevant. There's quite a lot of literature about them. But Interestingly, there hasn't been any work in the invertebrate world on the PCBs. Most of the data comes from vertebrates. And, and now we are investigating what pathways these genes are going to be impacting. But we do see um, a, a significant change in the expression of these kind of functional barcodes, if you will. Sorry, I went a couple of minutes over time. Uh, that was my final slide. Thanks again for your attention and for being here with us. And, uh, and I would like to thank my lab uh, for doing all the work, the organizers in bio and across uh, the world and helping, helping us and also the funding agencies. And thank you very much. brilliant talks and keeping on time. Thank you. So just as uh, by way of a quick reminder, uh, we have one parallel session this afternoon after lunch starting at two and then our poster session back in the science complex. Immediately after the poster session at 530, we'll be loading up at the bus loop to head downtown for our special evening plenary session at the River Run Center. Also, for those of you interested in attending the CFIA workshop, that's starting back here in 107 Rosansky, but it begins at 1.30, so a little earlier than the uh, other plenary sessions. Hey, can you put back the... Uh